so welcome to the Filipino Canadian Comic Symposium. Uh, my name is Luke Tromley. Um, I teach in the Department of English, Theatre, Film and Media at the University of Manitoba. Um, it's going to be a great afternoon. Um, we're going to hear, for some, uh, hear from some very talented uh, Fili Filipino Canadian and Philippinex creators, um, as well as uh, from some academic experts in the fields of Asian Canadian uh, studies and comic studies. So I'm in Winnipeg right now. I'm on Treaty 1 territory. Um, I teach at the University of Manitoba, which is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, as well as on the homeland of the Nati Nation. Um, I know we've got um, audience members here from all over, and I'm kind of curious to, to, to know where you're from. Um, so the chat function is open. Um, if you don't mind, um, I, I'd love it if you let me know uh, where, where you're situated right now. Um, if you know the traditional name of the territory you're on, um, share it out in the chat. And if you want to use the settler name uh, for your location, uh, uh, do that as well. Um, I, I hope we're, we're reaching people from all over. So uh, before we get going, I've got some thank yous uh, I want to share. Uh, first, from the University of Manitoba Institute for the Humanities, I want to thank Dr. Serenity Jew and Dr. Vanessa Warren. Uh, from the Faculty of Arts, I want to thank Haley Gajahar and Alex McGregor. Um, I want to thank uh, Joanna Kakeo for our awesome symposium poster. Um, I want to thank Archie from the Filipino Fridays podcast. Um, and we're going to put uh, some links to some resources up in the chat. Um, I'm going to thank um, Nat from uh, Philippinex Pages, which is a great uh, uh, Instagram site. I'd also like to thank Ro from the Canadian Comics Open Library. Um, Thank you as well to the publishers who've donated comics for our prize packs, and we'll get to those in a minute. So uh, thanks to Daisy D at Anak Publishing Worker Cooperative. Thanks to Arsenal Pulp Press, Oni Press, and Lev Gleason Publishing. And I've got to say an extra big thanks to three people. Uh, first to Akene Matuka, Maduka from the University of Manitoba Institute uh, for the Humanities, and also for my uh, incredible RAs, Agina Daskal and Jesse Cran, uh, who are both graduate students here at the U of M. And finally, I'm grateful to the funders who are uh, supporting today's event, uh, the University of Manitoba Institute of Humanities and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Okay, so uh, just a couple of technical issues. Um, we're streaming today's event on the University of Manitoba Institute for the Humanities Facebook page. Um, we're recording and the recording will be thrown up on the Institute for the Humanities uh, YouTube page. Um, if you have to leave the call to make a sandwich or walk the dog, uh, please go ahead and re-enter the call uh, via the link that you've been sent. Um, for the sake of bandwidth, um, we've turned off cameras and microphones, uh, but uh, I really, really want to hear from our audience. Um, so the, the Q&A function um, is open for questions, and I, I really encourage you to ask questions. I think there's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, the chat function is open too, so we're going to be looking there for um, uh, questions as well. Uh, finally, um, after each of our two creator panels, um, we're going to be holding giveaways. Um, we've got awesome prize packs that are made up of comics um, from some of today's panelists. Um, the thing is, though, you have to be on the call to win. So yeah. be sure to stick around once the panels are over so we can, uh, we can give you prizes. Um, so I organized today's symposium for a couple of reasons. Um, mainly, I'm a really big fan of all of the creators um, who are going to be speaking today. Um, their work is really, really good. And I encourage you to seek it out if you don't know it. Um, at the beginning of each panel, we're going to be putting um, panelists' um, social media information uh, in the chat uh, so you can check out uh, more of their work. Beyond that, um, the more I learn about work by Filipino-Canadian comics creators, and, and, and the more I learn about Filipino North American comics in general, um, the more I think it's really an underappreciated body of work. Um, there is a lot of it, and it's really rich and vibrant and, and, and diverse, um, and I think it deserves to be circulated and celebrated and taught and studied. Um, I, I want to try to help with this process. And so for those of you who are interested in academic criticism, uh, writing it or reading it, um, 
I'd, um, I'm putting a call for proposals um, for a proposed special issue of an academic journal um, about comics uh, in the global Filipino diaspora into the chat. Um, so check it out if you think you might be interested. Um, at, send me an email um, uh, if you want to talk about it. However, um, even though I think academia is slow to catch up uh, with this body of work, um, we are extremely lucky today uh, because the person who I consider to be really the preeminent scholar of Filipino, Filipino Canadian literary studies um, is here with us today and she likes comics. Um, and it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today, uh, Dr. Eleanor T. Uh, Dr. T is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and is a professor of English at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, Dr. T has published on cultural memory, graphic novel, um, Asian North American literature and 18th century literature. Um, she was a Fulbright, Fulbright Canada visiting scholar at UC Santa Barbara in 2019. And uh, her work is fascinating. Uh, her recent books include uh, Asian Fail, Narratives of Disenchantment and the Model Minority in 2017, uh, Unfastened, Globality and Asian North American Narratives uh, from 2010, and the politics of the visible in Asian North American narratives from 2004. Um, so I am delighted that she's here with us and I'm gonna turn things over to her. Thank you very much. Magandang umaga, magandang araw. Um, I'm speaking from California where I'm spending my sabbatical. So it's still morning here. Um, Thank you, Luke, for organizing this wonderful symposium. I think it's the first ever symposium highlighting Filipino Canadian comics. Um, so I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be reading a paper because I'm an academic and I can't just speak off the cuff of my uh, top of my head. And also, um, uh, I'm very happy to be listening to the afternoon um, um, artists today. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'll be sharing my screen in a minute. Um, so I've titled my paper, Filipino Canadian Comics, Representation and Power. When talking about Filipino North American comics, the first name that comes to mind for many readers is Linda Berry. Berry's 100 Demons has established her as the most important comic creator of the 21st century, her use of Filipino legends such as the Aswang, her techniques of collage. Wait one second. Oh, I was just gonna share my screen, but it's just Um, okay, wait, sorry. Okay. So can you see this? All right, sorry. Her use of Filipino legends such as the Aswang her technique of collage, just juxtaposing scenes from her childhood with voice, the voice of an adult in her memoir were innovative and impressive in the early 2000s as they are now. So Barry's work showed that there was an interest in stories about ethnic subjects, specifically in a graphic memoir about a gawky, multiracial Filipina woman and her traumatic coming of age. Until about a decade ago, it seemed that Barry was the sole representative of Filipino comic authors in North America. In recent years, scholars have highlighted many other Filipino North American artists. Um, someone like Melinda de Jesus and also Luke Tromley have written about contributions of other Filipino, Filipina, North American comic creators. So in addition to uh, her seminal essay on mothers and um, in Linda Berry, De Jesus has written a chapter on Egyptian, Filipina American Malaka Garib and Filipina American Trinidad Escobar, which will be published in a volume I'm editing currently called Beyond the Icon. 
Asian American graphic narratives, which will come out um, at the end of this year. Luke Chomley presented a paper called Are There Mananangal in Canada, where he examines four Filipino Canadian comics, including Emmanuel Chateauneuf, Lubina Mappa, Alan Matudio, and Jay Torres and Albert Orr. So Chomley emphasized the differences in genre and political orientation of the works he studied. Um, as Matudio's Kasama and Ors Lola are targeted at a younger audience, while Chateauneuf's Queen Street and Mappa's Imelda Marcos, Duran Duran and Me are for adults. For Tromley, these fictional and autobiographical narratives depict strong community bonds and belonging in these comics set in the Philippines and also in the diaspora. So building and expanding on Tromley's paper and on Filipino Canadian comics, I want to discuss here just three examples of work by Filipino artists that reveal the range and uses of comic and graphic illustration. I want to show the ways that comics can participate in the formation of what Stuart Hall calls cultural identity and the politics of representation. Hall reminds us that the practices of representation always implicate positions. And um, what theories of enunciation suggest is that even though we speak or so to say in our own name of ourselves and from our own experiences, nevertheless, who speaks and the subject who is spoken of are never exactly in the same place. Identity is not as unproblematic or as transparent as we think. So one question that uh, we can consider is how can comics question presuppositions and beliefs about Filipino Canadian identity? How can comics rewrite rather than reproduce stereotypes? So my examples are gonna come from uh, what I call um, data comics and autobiographical graphic novel and the collaborative work uh, illustrations for a podcast. So in the, in the first case, the multimodal work of Quentong Bayan Collective to represent and tell the story of caregivers in Canada used a short comic narrative and art installation and what can be called data comics headed by, by Althea Balmes and Joe Simalaya Alcampo. Quentong Bayan created a visual timeline of caregiving work in Canada to examine over 150 year history of care work performed by racialized women in Canada. As Joe Simalaya explains, this poster was part of Remember, Resist, Redraw, a radical history poster project coordinated by the Graphic History Collective, an essay written by Dr. Etel Tungohan accompanies the original format of the timeline. So this poster was subsequently adapted into an art installation that has been shown in galleries in Toronto, Mississauga, Hamilton, and also in France. Filipinas are only part of Quentong Bayan's Caregiving in Canada poster, as the infographic begins in the 1600s with the mention of slaves and indigenous people as domestics and servants, followed by recruits of domestic workers from the British colonies of Jamaica and Barbados. What is striking about the poster is the large middle section, which shows a solidarity of women of various ethnicities and cultures with the slogan, good enough to work, good enough to stay. The illustration shows a number of strong faces to celebrate the victories over the years. The accompanying text talks about how the foreign domestic movement in 1981 wins domestic workers with temporary work permits, um, permanent residency after two years of live and work. The overall tone is one of resilience and progress as the final illustration features um, women with their fists raised proclaiming caregivers are skilled workers. The poster goes a long way in representing foreign domestic workers as empowered rather than servile women 
participating in the work of social and political advocacy. So in addition to this um, visual timeline, Guentong Bayan Collective has also con contributed a short mini graphic narrative called Labor of Love to Drawn to Change. And again, the theme of the comics is the collectivity and resistance to unfair label practices by Filipina and Jamaican workers and caregivers. The large panel um, entitled Late 70s Breaking the Isolation shows women gathering in the mall, supporting each other, talking about foods they have learned to cook, Filipino foods they miss. The panel juxtaposes the formal and factual language about the temporary employment found at the top of the narrative box. I think it's cut off in the picture. Um, and the informal chit chat and chismis of the caregivers illustrated in the panel. The title, Breaking the Isolation, emphasizes the care and community that the Yayas shows um, for each other, which is different from other studies of Filipina caregivers. So by and large, scholarly work on Filipina caregivers refer to them as servants or temporary workers, temporary foreign workers, emphasizing their liminal status. So um, in stories and documentaries and theater productions, there's a lot of time spent on how these domestic workers are, um, have faced challenges or abused, et cetera. So, This is one example of a very good scholar, Rafael Pareñas. Um, but what I'm suggesting here is that the representation in many ways highlights the way domestic caregivers are victims of circumstance, servants of globalization. Um, whereas what I was trying to suggest in the comics is that they're represented as active agents of change. So in their study of the effectiveness of data comics and infographic, uh, Ji Song Wang and others found that data comics are seen to be more fun, uh, help readers stay focused and overall more engaging than um, representing information as text or illustrated text even, because these comics draw from traditional um, the tradition of comics and combine techniques from infographic data visualization, journalism, and other forms of visual explanation. So while the mini comic uh, labor of love has lim limited sequencing, it could be read as an example of data comics showing a static moment in the history of caregivers in Canada. So these comics are engaging, informative, instruct instructive. Um, in this a panel called Community PND Seaton Park, Balmas and Alcampo um, demonstrate the informal networks created by caregivers who celebrate Philippine National Day, June 12. In the scene, there's not a lot of dialogue, but food, uh, namely lechon, um, is being paraded and shared. The emphasis on the narrative is the ability of Filipina domestic workers to organize and assert their rights create a strong community and enjoy food, a lot of food. Um, so my second example of how comics has the power to re-envision our circumstance comes from Emmanuel Chateauneuf's uh, Queen Street. So this autobiographical graphic novel is important, one, because it highlights the realities of growing up in a small northern um, town in Ontario. And rather than an urban center. And two, it highlights um, the, the experience in the from the perspective of a child. So telling her story from a girl's perspective allows Shatanov to illustrate the different ways a first and second generation immigrant handles microaggressions in everyday life. Her drawings influenced by manga artists show that in spite of their isolation, the townspeople's attitudes and the low economic status, the protagonist Melody still manages to find unicorns, princesses, and the magic in life. Chateauneuf uses comedy and exaggeration to delineate the disillusionment and challenges of being a racialized immigrant in Canada. 
near the beginning, uh, instead of lamenting her loss of employment, Amy, uh, Melody's mother is defiant and indignant. She has the discourse and knowledge to challenge her boss who has not paid her the wages she owes. But more importantly, being the ch only child of an immigrant mother and the frequently absent truck driver father, Mel Melody learns to entertain herself with her fantasies and comics. At one point when her mother comes to pick her up from the neighbor's house, the scene shifts from her babysitter, an old woman, to what appears to be a jungle scene. There is a bespeckled child swinging from a tree vine with a spear, um, in a setting that looks like a rainforest, the dialogue of the two women who are speaking um, is at odds with the visuals, which are intense and very dramatic. Through her graphic novel, Chateauneuf reveals the way a child handles isolation and some social deprivation. Chateauneuf transports us from the mundane to the exotic with very little warning, which is both exciting and a bit jarring. The, ab the abrupt transition between settings suggests that in Melody's mind, her fantasies are as real as her, um, um, as reality, or, that's very, or that there is very little distinction between them. The jungle scenes are lavishly detailed. Oh, sorry, my visuals aren't great. Um, um, and with depth, perspective, sound, and even a narrative voice providing explanations. So one splash panel with Melody charging at the animal is larger than life with, hyperbolic, with a hyperbolic monster creature. These fantasy scenes challenge both the boundaries of fantasy and reality and also the cultural expectations of gender. In her imagination, Melody is very much like a Tarzan, fending off tigers. She's not Jane. She is the adventurer, um, not the lady in waiting. So these scenes contrast with the scene, the scenes of Melody in her dance class, where there's a bevy of girls talking about girly things like clothes, hair wraps, and pretty nails. Melody feels excluded uh, from these conversations. And when she tries to chime in, one of the girls tells her to stop butting into our conversation. So the contrast between hunting for tigers and dealing with a hostile group of ballerinas is very telling. These day-to-day -day painful interactions remind her of her outsider status and force her to retreat into her interior world. So in the drawings, you see Shatanov represents Melody as the only dark-haired girl in the group. And she is depicted um, small and alone uh, in her own panel at the bottom. Um, um, uh, apart from the other girls. So the hurtful comments penetrate through the gutter, suggesting the power of language to hurt children. She is no longer like the Tarzan of the previous scenes. So although immigration has substantially increased the racial diversity of the Canadian population, as Jeffrey writes and Rupa Banerjee observed, the feelings of discrimination and racial inequality among children of immigrants are still present. One third of children of non-European immigrants report um, having experienced discrimination. Melody's problems are exacerbated by the fact that she's the only Filipina in a small town of mainly Franco and Anglo Canadians. But Shadanov also shows how rapidly a child's feelings can change and what a difference one nice friend can make. This is not the stuff of tragedy, but a lighthearted view of um, immigrant children's reality. Not all the girls in the dance class are bullies. Um, in the next scene, a girl offers Melody some candy and Melody immediately feels a bond with her. And her delight is shown through another abrupt um, scene change where suddenly the plain background of the dance classroom becomes a kind of enchanted forest. The two girls are still doing their ballet exercises, but they're now like fairies or nymphs in the woods. Melody's joy is shattered only when the dance class teacher scolds her for speaking. Shadowneuf's Queen Street shows everyday challenges that Filipina immigrants face in a small town in an autobiographical graphic narrative that's quirky, fun, and full of adventure. 
Instead of relying on stereotypes, Sharonov uses humor, exaggeration, the juxtaposition between melody and her mother's perspective, between the mundane and the fantastic to depict life at the edges of North American society. It is not strictly a, a memoir, but it does attempt to reveal emotional rather than literal truths. Elizabeth L. Rafai notes of autobiographical comics, graphic memoirists are much more interested in reflecting their feelings toward their past in an authentic manner than in claiming to portray the absolute truth, openly admitting that this, this necessarily involves diverging from the historical facts in some instances. The gap between the actual and the represented self is further emphasized in some works by the fact that the protagonist does not share the same name as the author. Um, in an interview, Chateau Neuf has called Queen Street a semi-autobiographical and technically a biographical comics. Calling herself mix and person of color, she observes that though this story is about immigrants, it does not follow the usual trajectory of struggle and then survival. Instead, it's a slice of life um, from a child's perspective. These kinds of autobiographical narratives are important because as Charles Hatfield observes of alternative comics, such projects have an ideological subtext, specifically a democratic one, since they celebrate the endurance and everyday heroism of the so-called average person in the face of co corporate culture. Shadowneuf shows that though her childhood days were not always filled with joy, she nevertheless managed to find her own heroes and her own wonderland, even in an isolated small town community. So my last example uh, of how comics can serve to represent or present again Filipino Canadian identity comes from the illustrations created by Lorena Mapa for the CBC Pop podcast, Recovering Filipino. So as some of you um, know, CBC commissioned uh, three original comics to go with um, Jim Agapito's humorous and somewhat um, irreverent series on Filipino culture. Agapito performs the role of the naive narrator as he asks his mother, his grandmother, as well as the Filipinx community leaders about Filipino history, customs, and traditions. Topics of his podcast include immigration, basketball, Filipino foods, superstitions, karaoke. The podcast is a work of autoethnography designed for Filipinos and non-Filipinos. For the purposes of this paper, I want to talk about MAPA's illustrations and how they create a friendly and acceptable persona for the general public. This podcast series and the accompanying illustrations mark a big breakthrough in representations of Filipino Canadians because they're hosted by CBC, our national broadcaster, and likely to garner a wide audience. So in How Can I Make Lola Proud, Mapla's illustrations are effective because of their iconic and simple style. Scott McLeod has pointed out that comics work by iconic images, by representations that are simplistic rather than photorealistic. So Mapla draws, draws Jim Agapito, his mother and Yolanda in black and white cartoonish drawings, making them identifiable, realistic, and putting a toque on Jim makes him quintessentially Canadian. So the illustrations that accompany the opening podcast works the same way as a cultural anthropologist description of um, an exotic culture to make the unusual seem usual and familiar. Um, so this series of illustrations, uh, she also has a sampling of Filipino um, bagain, are not recipes exactly, but user-friendly descriptions of a common Filipino food, such as chicken and pork adobo, pancit and halo halo. These illustrations, like the podcast, serve to render recognizable what some say European Canadians might consider exotic foods by detailing their various ingredients, how to pronounce their Tagalog words. 
So I'm somewhat amused that Mapa included the brand names um, in her illustrations. She said to make uh, Filipinos uh, identify with them. Um, it was exciting to see Hello Hello ingredients deconstructed and labeled la layer by layer. Um, and uh, certainly it made me want to have one. Um, one small worry I have is whether the illustrations and explanations of, for example, this, what a balut is, um, might in fact turn into a kind of self-exoticization. So the image of the hatch duck is very reminiscent of a fetus. And um, so because balut is the kind of food like fried insects in Thailand or Chinese snake soup, that tends to be included in reality TV shows like Survivor. So I'm wondering if this kind of exoticization um, um, might be problematic. And it's, kind, it's somewhat exacerbated by Jim Agapito's, Agapito's comment um, in his podcast when he says, you know, aside from a few favorites like lumpia, I don't eat Filipino food. So the question I want to raise, and maybe we can discuss this, is how to depict Filipino identity without succumbing to a kind of Orientalist gaze? How do we represent difference and garner respect without the risk of being seen as further othered or seen as primitive? Um, of the three comics, the most impressive one uh, is the history of women's basketball in the Philippines, because in five panels, it presents a very succinct history of how basketball uh, came to be a favorite sport of Filipinos. And at the same time, it pr performs a strong gender and colonialist critique. Um, so the, the title page um, shows a basketball at the feet of a girl wearing chinelas, uh, which was rather cute. Um, we discover that basketball is actually part of American colonial education um, brought by teachers for girls. But afterwards, the sport was banned because it was in the, because the women, the girls were wearing inappropriate clothing. So this panel I found very impressive because it features this oversized Catholic nun rep reprimanding the dwarf size uh, Filipina girl with a basketball. So the size difference highlights the inordinate power wielded by the Catholic church. Mapa shows um, how girls were later excluded from the game for decades after that. Um, so she's literally in the sidelines and um, while well, boys played this. So while the focus of the podcast is on Philippine basketball, the last panel of Mapa's comics focuses on the first Filipino player in WNBA history. So Mapa's comics um, goes further than the podcast, including includes a feminist and colonialist reading of basketball history that's not present in Agapito's um, um, podcast. They add a more serious side to the podcast and further our understanding of how gender ideologies intersect with religion and politics in early 20th century neo-colonial Philippines. So my, my three examples are somewhat eclectic. I wanted to show how comics can influence and change public perceptions of Filipino Canadians. Fictional and non-fictional comics not only reflect, but can also shape our sense of ourselves, our changing identities in the 21st century. As Filipino Canadians grow in number, it is important that representations in arts and novels, films, comics, show the many facets of our history, aspirations, achievements, and experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that uh, kind of really sort of uh, uh, wide ranging uh, uh, survey. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, 
Now, uh, I want to say to audience members, um, the uh, uh, the Q and A is open, and so um, I, I would love. I know that there there are uh, reactions, uh, and and I think uh, Dr. P would be, be happy to 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 take questions. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on the first one. I'll be selfish, um, and I want to um, just sort of think about your your idea about the sort of tricky area between um, self uh, representation and kind of orientalism, right? And I, I think this is a really interesting issue because kind of historically, comics have often been full of really ugly and dehumanizing um, uh, racial stereotypes. And uh, this is certainly true if you look at uh, Filipino American history, because there's a big cartoon legacy uh, about um, uh, the Philippine American War. And I mean, I, I guess, you know, one question I have is, to a certain extent, is this a question of, of, of audience, right? Whether you think potentially different readers might be seeing different things. Um, yeah, I think having a context is important. So um, when, when the the Filipino foods were being presented. It wasn't. It, it wasn't super. I think Orientalist, but I. But it did strike me as I was looking at that. You know that um, it might be a little bit problematic in terms of uh, what was being presented. I think there's a com a comment in the chat about um, the background in weird food. So it, I think um, uh, other people also have the the same. Um, answer to that, right? Um, it's just that sometimes without knowing the reasons why certain foods like chicken feet are e eaten or something, it, it can reinforce, you know, the, the stereotypes of being primitive, etc. But I'm, I'm wondering what other people think too. Um, Emmanuel, why don't you why don't you jump in? Oh, I just have more of a question, I guess. It's not so much a it's another question. We could save it though if people still want to talk about the I put my hand up for later, I meant. Go ahead, I think it's okay. <laughs> um, so I was really interested about how you talked about like the ideological subtext of like certain immigrant experiences and how there's kind of this expected story for immigrants. To like oh suffer at the hands of the white men and then like <laughs> rise up and like be the hero of their own story and all that kind of thing like I remember I did like the most faux pas thing as a as a reader or as a writer and then like read my Goodread reviews or something or my Google <laughs> reviews and I had a reader say that my immigrant story wasn't immigranty enough <laughs> like that what does that even mean because when I was writing this book I didn't even think of it. I'm like, I'm writing an immigrant story. I was like, I'm just writing my childhood and I'm writing all the funny, weird people who are in my life. And very, I guess, like ignorantly kind of was just like, I'm just going to write a story. And I didn't even think about it at all in that context. And when you said like the ideological subtext, the idea that there's this expectation that like to be a good immigrant, to, you know, be a good first generation settler, there's this I don't know, like, is that something that you've encountered in a lot of um, like BIPOC literature or because like, I definitely have seen it from like the perspectives of other races writing about other races and how they view like, oh, the struggle. I'm so inspired to be a better person and all that kind of stuff. But like, have you witnessed that in other people? Um, yeah, I think there are definitely, in, especially in the 80s and 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, there's a lot of stories that depict the kind of immigrant uh, sort of move, move uh, assimilation, and then kind of eventual success, and and they're usually reinforcing the kind of um, American dream narrative. Um, even the one that I talked about, Malaka Garib, uh, she's Egyptian Filipina. There is a little bit of that as well about how her parents came over, and you know they she faced certain hardships, but in the end, it worked out okay. So there's a lot of that. And I think your um, book just doesn't quite fit that arc or trajectory, which is why it's so different. I think um, 
you know. So, so there is, uh, I think people are challenging that now, today, in more recent years, by writing different kinds of narratives, by using sort of maybe sometimes speculative fiction, uh, the kind of work that you're doing, or just, but, but certainly I think there was um, a tendency or expectation for that kind of immigrant story for the longest time. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I, one of the things that also struck me about um, uh, your, your comments was this idea of sort of the gap. Right, and you talked a little bit about the gap between the actual um, and the represented, and and obviously when we're talking about pol uh, comics, there are all kinds of gaps, right? There, there are gutters, there are gaps between images, um, and, and I guess I, I I sort of just sort of wonder whether um, these sorts of gaps, these sorts of tensions, I mean, whether you see that in in sort of other comics that you've been um, studying. Um, gaps as in, I think, I think the um, gaps can be used very fruitfully by comic artists to show sometimes distance, but also to show how kind of boundaries are challenged, literally like drawing gaps. Um, in metaphorically, I think gaps um, can also be filled by I think uh, I just finished teaching a, a Asian American graphic novel course here. Um, and I think that students really loved it because I think what it filled in were gaps for them about history, about their own lives that they didn't really read about um, in, other, um, in other courses. So it can fill in gaps in a very engaging and fruitful way. And I think I was trying to suggest, you know, by that first um, first example, that it was also a way of providing um, information without falling into the the same kind of uh, stereotypes of Filipina women as victims. Because um, for the longest time, like in the '90s, when you sort of googled. Filipina immigrants or like in the news, it was always about the problems with the, whether or not to continue with the caregiver program, the live-in caregiver, those kind of things, but not all Filipinos and Filipinas are caregivers, right? There's a lot of people who also came uh, as other, like as nurses, doctors, technicians, professional workers, et cetera. And I think we don't see those people's stories that much. I think it's, start, it's starting now with the comics that uh, you're highlighting today. But I mean, for the longest time when I was growing up in Canada, I didn't really see those stories um, of myself. I'm really glad that you uh, brought up uh, the work by the uh, Kwantung Bayan Collective. Um, one of the things I really like about their work is you've got these very big panels um, full of lots of different people and they're all arguing, <laughs> and, and, which is really nice. I mean, because in a way, um, um, even though I think those comics uh, feature in, in, in some ways a community that, as you're saying, is often pictured as being a little bit kind of monolithic and undifferentiated. Um, that comic really, really emphasizes the diversity among people um, uh, who, who are in it. Now, um, I'm uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, questions in the chat. Um, Jesse's asking um, whether you think there are certain advantages of comic narratives in matters of representation that other visual media like photography or film perhaps don't have. Um, Can comics, yeah. Yeah, I I think that the com the advantage to comics is that you can read it at your own time, whereas a film, you follow the pace of the film, um, and also there's a lot more imagination in a comics than a film, which gives you the people's faces and uh, gives you the actors uh, that you have that. Um, I like comics because it's sort of a uh, it's not quite a novel where everything is, is just words, but it's not quite film where 
there's a lot of visuals uh, and music, et cetera, given to you. So I think comics has, uh, makes you work and read sometimes what's not there, trying to link between the visuals and the text. Um, so there's a bit of work uh, in that, um, in kind of making the leap, uh, what's called closure in comics. But um, I think that has the advantage, but it, it can also bring in a lot of you know, other things like history, for example. Uh, it can talk about the past, the present, almost uh, simultaneously on a page. Uh, by by presenting different scenes, so there's a lot of different things that comics can do that work. And I think today in our in our society, a lot of our a lot of young people, students, um, like the visual aspects a lot. They they kind of function um, with Instagram and other things. You know, like they're very used to that. So it works really really well. Um, to if you want to, you know, include comics as like giving history, giving a background, cultural, um, um, a study of different cultures, etc. It works really well. Yeah, I, I'm just just um, I'm looking. There's a really interesting conversation in the chat about, in some ways, the sort of insufficiency or the exclusionary nature of the sort of the single story of history or the single story of identity. And what you're saying seems to really resonate in this because I mean, comics seem to be very well equipped to not give a single story, to uh, provide uh, multiple perspectives, um, multiple realities within the same narrative. Um, and, and so I think that this is, um, this is one of the reasons that um, I think there's such a huge, um, political potential uh, in comics, um, even though, well, of course, they're often um, really fun to read, too. Um, <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any questions? Um, uh, any, so yeah, Lindsay, go ahead. Um, I have to apologize because I haven't fully worked out my question. <laughs> I'll be sort of reaching for it as I talk. So. Um, I was just picking up on something that uh, Luke mentioned earlier about how uh, maybe the narrative in the United States about the relationship between, you know, Americans and Filipinos is a little more defined because of American imperialism. You know, there's that, um, there's that connection between the, a history that's maybe more known. Uh, between the United States and, uh, and the Philippines. So um, my question really comes from more recently looking at uh, Vietnamese Canadian literature and the discussion that's going on in relation to that literature and that in Canada, the conversation is hard to have about Filipino Canadian history and identity because maybe there's not a lot of understanding about Canada's role, say, in the, Vietnam, uh, in the Vietnam War, or what our relationship is to um, Vietnamese Canadians or how Vietnamese Canadians came here, other than just, you know, Canada is such a great place, we let Vietnamese Canadians, you know, we, we let uh, refugees come here. You know, there's um, a sort of forgetting of complicity or a forgetting of a longer history that Canada's part of as far as, you know, all these sort of colonial entanglements or, you know, why people might be leaving Vietnam or why people might be um, forming these sort of transnational life worlds, right, which are present in the, some of the comic books where, you know, families are dispersed and um, there are roots in different roots and roots like R-O-O-T-S, but also roots as in R-O-U-T-E-S, you know, roots in various uh, nations, including Canada. Um, so I wonder just about like, questions about Canada in particular and about the importance of Vietnamese, not Vietnamese, sorry, Filipino Canadian literature here and the conversations that can start here as far as is it harder to start those conversations and what do um and how much awareness is there of 
a history or a relationship uh, with the Philippines, um, you know, that stretches back in time, not just, you know, a recent phenomenon. I, I don't know if I'm making sense. <laughs> yeah, but, I think yeah. I think you're right that there is a difference between the way Filipinos are um, perceived in America and in Canada, because America has the colonial history and they study it as part of their um, the history that you know that they did they were in the Philippines um, for 50 years whereas in Canada we don't have that colonial history and our, our but our and our history is more um, I, I suppose I suppose that was why uh, the caregivers are highlighted so much it's more recent and the and the connection with the Philippines has been about um, these caregivers coming. Um, I think the stories are changing, but you know, so, so because we're, um, the, the racial politics in America are much, are much starker, I think. Uh, like they're, they talk about black and whites and then they talk about Latinas, which we don't really have. But, but in fact, um, I, I was just thinking about how different, um, even today, right now, with what's happening in Ukraine, that in Canada, we, we're so familiar with Ukrainians because there's so many Ukrainians. Whereas the, 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 the population, I was looking this up, the population of Ukrainians in Canada, there's more Ukrainians in Canada than there are in the United States. And yet the United States is 10 times our size. So I guess I'm suggesting that, um, some populations, like even the Filipinos, they, there's a lot of Filipinos in Canada, but uh, um, I, I talked about this before, that they tend to be very invisible because we're so, in, in many ways, we adapt so well. We speak English. We don't challenge the religion because uh, like we are Christians. Um, so that even though there's a lot of us, and it, I think Filipinos and um, South Asians are the largest immigrants coming into Canada right now, that we don't, um, we're, we're not in the news a lot because we don't create a ruckus about stuff. Um, um, and in many ways, our stories are not as prominent. Like we don't, we don't have a Filipino Canadian TV show. Um, it's hard to it's hard to start those. Um, you know, I, I think. Well, it's e even hard to have Asian Canadian shows. Like Kim's Convenience is one, but there's hardly there's hardly any, or even Filipinos in film. There, are, I can like name two Filipino Canadians. I mean. I think Rena has a comment. Oh, I'll go after uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, I think, has just left her hand up. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, 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 it's interesting what you were saying about yes, we we have always Filipinos have always blended in North America because we don't make a fuss. We just so adaptable, and it's been that way for decades. Um, and it's I, actually I wanted to make the comparison to comic strip or comic book and comic strip artists uh, in North America, because maybe what people don't realize is there's been quite a long history of comic book artists in North America, Filipino comic book artists in North America. And um, like I know, I think back in the 60s, uh, Marvel and DC went on some like they found they found uh, one or two and then they went to the Philippines and recruited a whole bunch because there was so much talent there. And uh, that's not even known. So, so it's Filipinos who moved to North America, joined studios, created studios, contributed so much to you know, Marvel and DC, but no one even knew about it. Um, I think that uh, you know, those classics illustrated comics that you know, Treasure Island and, and and all that stuff. Those were all like created by by like uh, oh what's his name? I used to know their names. Um, 
so so to me, I didn't just... know about Treasure Island, but I, I oh, knew I, about... I don't know about that title specifically, but for the classics illustrated, for yeah, example, yeah, um, and uh, um, even even like in the eighties, like like a lot of these Marvel, um, X Men, Spider Man, you know, they're all drawn by Filipinos, but again, no one is. Yeah, they're no, not no given like, credit. Well, yeah. I mean, they're just sort of known as the artists of mm -hmm. Marvel comics. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not necessarily highlighted. And now if there seems to be a lot or like I feel like there's been an explosion in the last few years um, of uh, but that that it's known that it's Filipinos. I think even when I was writing my book, which was a, a while ago now, I I mean, I kind of live in a bubble anyway. Um, I'm kind of isolated anyway. And I was not. Like all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> come by and everyone's here, <laughs> you know. So, so I find that it. Uh, I mean, since this is a comic symposium, it kind of goes with what you're saying that even since the '60s, uh, we've had you know comic book, famous comic book and comic strip artists who contributed greatly. I went to a comic book art school in New Jersey, and uh, run by um, his name is Joe Kubert, who did all this stuff for DC. And all the teachers there, when they found out I was Filipino, oh, do you know this? Do you know that? They were so in awe of the Filipino talent uh, that, you know, that was in uh, contributing to uh, to these comic books. Anyway, that was just, just a little bit of comic history. Thank you. Is there someone? Oh, Emmanuel wants to talk. <laughs> I put my hand back up purposely. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I was just thinking, um, kind of just, it's more of a comment or like a thought based on like the conversation you guys started of the idea that like, you know, again, Filipinos and people from Filipino cultures have really successfully like integrated themselves into the space of others. And like, I was thinking, cause I've been unpacking this within myself recently. It's been like my 2022 promise to myself that I would start setting much more healthy boundaries <laughs> with people because I remembered ever since I was a child, like my mom because again, my father was always gone. So my mom basically raised me in a white space with Filipino values. And it was very Christian, very Catholic, very self-sacrificial, very do unto others. Like if you have even one last shred of bread, you give that to someone else because they are more in need. Like you never know, like which stranger on the street could be Jesus in disguise kind of stuff. <laughs> I have so many moments. And, you know, so I would, I was always kind of like, raised with the like show compassion show forgiveness like you know you're a guest here and I guess like those kind of immigrant values of like sort of things so I couldn't help but think like as you as you talked about it and how how so much of that and like is some of that also due to not only you know because you know our religion is like divergent of and it's similar um like the language and like the food and and just it's also I feel personally which is just part of the culture of learning to like you know be joyous and be happy and be grateful and to help and not to so much like start a fight but more be like you know what it's fine it's called quits it's it's cool like I see you you see me and like let bygones be bygones versus you know which like the difference now where it's like as much as that's fair and compassionate and good there is a time to kind of be like you know what I think <laughs> time for me to step up anyway yeah. yeah it's it's i think um that's i think what i'm suggesting there's a, a shift i think in um today um, and it's a fine line because um you know how to go from kind of being the sort of well assimilated canadian to to being more visible like what what do we want to be known for and i think that's why i was talking about representation um maybe it's not one thing maybe it's a series of things um i think there's another question april and then alan yeah no i was just gonna say um just such a similar experience of my mom like even my name is april joy and she was like i chose joy because it's J for Jesus first, O for others second, Y for you last, putting yourself last and making sure. And just like, and even from when I was very little, she'd be like, if someone, if something happens to someone else, you have to say you're sorry, even if you didn't do it. And it, yeah, just such a similar experience. If, I feel like it took like 
it's taken like 30 years to like try and be like how can I balance like compassion and love for others with like also yeah the same thing like boundaries and like it's been learning and unlearning so it's definitely been interesting yeah thank you Alan yeah I wanted to comment on the shift um that we're seeing and I think the shift is not just in comics right but just in Filipino media in general well Filipino diasporic content in general and I think um, a big part of it has to do with just a lot of Filipinos are climbing in terms of our socioeconomic status right like we need to um, understand that for the most part our migration channel is through um, like vulnerable working conditions and because of that it does take a few generations to climb that ladder to get the privilege to just do art to just do photography to just do film or comic books so um i think we're at the point now where um some of us do have that privilege like i'm one of them definitely and um yeah, so that's just my comment with respect to that. Yeah, I think that's that's really important, the kind of historical uh, time frame, because, um, well, I think earlier in the 60s, there, there were waves when there were nurses and doctors and teachers that came to the America and also to, to Canada. But then it was superseded by kind of, but we also had the garment workers for Winnipeg and, and that, um, but, Certainly in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of Filipinos brought in kind of sort of more lower middle class or, or the, the caregivers um, um, were brought in. So it does take another generation to, to realize some of these, I think what Alan was suggesting, kind of artistic potentials. Because even when I was growing up, um, I, would, I, I think I came in the 70s during Marcos with my family, but I remember fighting with my mother uh, after like in the, my last year of high school because I said I wanted to take English and she said, there'll be no job for you if you take English, you know, be an accountant. And um, so it was a big fight. And I think that's, uh, and I think a lot of parents uh, steer their children a lot of Asian parents, Filipino parents, steer their children to more practical kind of jobs rather than art-related uh, things, which they see as luxuries. How are we doing for time? Well, I, I've never been so happy to be 15 minutes over time uh, in, in my life, um, and, and I don't <laughs> want to cut off this conversation. Um, I, I'm wondering whether people want to take a quick break or whether we should keep going on. Maybe a five minute break would be good. Yeah, yeah, let's, that's a good idea. Let's take five and come back at, a, at around 2.10 and we... Okay, um, maybe we should um, uh, pick it up again. Um, our next panel uh, is called Filipino Canadian Graphic Novels, and um, I have the, uh, the, the good fortune to uh, introduce the, the panel's moderator, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lindsay Thiel. Um, Lindsay is an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. Uh, her latest publications have appeared in Canadian Literature, English Studies in Canada, Canada and Beyond, and Postcolonial Text. Um, she's currently working on a monograph for Wilfrid Laurier University Press on Chinese Canadian literature, as well as a textbook on Routledge Press on Asian Canadian literature. So, Lindsay, take us away. Thanks for that introduction. I apologize, my Keurig's uh, going in the background. It's pretty much constant, <laughs> the amount of coffee I need these days. So I apologize if you hear that in the background. Okay, on today's panel, we have Emmanuel Princess Chateauneuf, who is a first-generation Filipino-French-Canadian illustrator, writer, singer, songwriter, dancer, and budding actress living in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Through her work, she aims to dismantle idolatry by telling her own life stories, 
be they fantastically metaphorical or slice of life adventures in modern times. Her current interests include martial arts, comparative mythology, and spiritualism. Lorena Mappa was born in Manila in 1970, and at the age of 16, moved with her family to Washington, DC. She graduated from the Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Art in New Jersey, where she met her husband, artist Daniel Shelton, creator of the comic strip, Ben. Her graphic novel, Duran Duran, Imelda Marcos and Me, was nominated by the American Library Association as a great graphic novel for teens. Lorena was featured on the CBC's list of writers to watch and nominated for the Joe Schuster Award for Best Writer. She lives with her husband and children in Hudson, Quebec. April de la Noche Milne is a Filipino Canadian illustrator based on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations known as Vancouver. April studied fine arts at Langara College and graduated with a BFA in illustration from Emily Carr University. She is the artist for the graphic novel, The Blue Road, A Fable of Migration, written by Wade Compton. April illustrated the, perfect, the Imperfect Garden, a children's book written by Melissa Asali, and uh, was one of the contributors to the Cloudscape Comics anthology, The Witching Hours. She regularly illustrates for the Globe and Mail's first person section and was one of the contributing artists to the anthology Chromatic, 10 Mediations on Crisis in Art and Letters. Okay. Um, so now that I have introduced the panelists, um, I really wanted to start a conversation. I think that we're just going to have a pretty uh, flowing um, type format for today. Um, maybe did any of the panelists uh, want to open with any comments or would you prefer me to uh, start by asking a question? I have a question <laughs> because uh, we're we're on a panel um, for Filipino Canadian graphic novels. And so often these kind of like generic labels, you know, Filipino Canadian graphic novels, you know, being an example, there's they come after the body of work is created, right? Um, and it's a way of sort of classifying the body of work and creating a conversation around it. But it's not necessarily there at the beginning when you're creating the work, right? Um, so I guess I would ask, you know, as far as Filipino Canadian as a uh, category or a name or an identification, how much was that, you know, on your mind when you were uh, making your comics? And, and you know, uh, what does it mean to you? Or how do you see it maybe becoming a topic in your in your writing? Me? Yeah, or, anyone, sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just, sorry, I just got in and I had a sip of coffee. I'm sorry. Um, someone else, April or Emmanuel, please answer. And I'll answer after. Um, <laughs> oh. Go for it, April. Go, go, girl, go. Um, I, I'm going to say I didn't. Because I, I wasn't writing, I was illustrating like Wade's story. Um, I and the story of the road is like a story about migration. So for me, it was like a really emotional story to illustrate because I was thinking about like my mom who's Filipino or who was Filipino and like my aunt and my grandparents. Um, so I was thinking about them the whole time that I was writing that I was illustrating it. So it was very like emotional for me, but I wasn't thinking about like the larger scheme of like the category of like Filipino Canadian um, graphic artists. Like I wasn't thinking about that. I think it felt like 
even though I didn't write it, it felt very personal. Um, and I wasn't thinking about like, how will I, I don't know. But I was excited to be invited here today. I was so excited to like connect with, I don't know, other Filipino Canadian creators. And I was like, ah, this is so exciting. It's something that I, I hope will like continue to grow and expand. And I feel like it is um, in terms of like a, a portion of the create creative community in Canada. But yeah, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question. May I? Yes, please. Um, well, the thing about my book, it was very funny. I didn't, I wrote it, like I made the whole thing when I was just 19, I was a baby. I was a child. And so when I wrote it, I wrote it, I think in like one or two sittings and it was supposed to be just um, like a little exercise with my mentor here in Toronto. And I just created an entire book and he was like, wow, this is someone eager. And then, you know, from there, the, kind, the ball just immediately started rolling. And then it came out and suddenly people were saying, oh, you're a Filipino creator. You're a this, you're a that. And like at this point, because I had, again, I was just 19. I was fresh out of like redneck Ontario. <laughs> and people, people, it was hard for me because like it was such a culture shock coming to Toronto for the first time and seeing other people of color. And at that time, I couldn't even call it that word. I would say, you know, like, that's a black person. That's a that. And I'd meet other Filipinos and I was shocked. And then so for people to suddenly say that you're a part of this community, this is your label, this is who you are. I was, you know, and then having a lot of reviews come out of my book or other people read my book and kind of glean things out of it that I hadn't, I just was like, my mentor told me to draw something that was true so I did and you know even after that like the book kind of for me at least spurred my own journey within myself to kind of be like you are safe or not safe now but you're in a new place now a new place where you can discover who you are because there's more people like you because back from the town that I was in like I'm hardly um I found something out like I'm quite white well depending on you know who is looking at me I can be white passing and other times I'm not. And, you know, it was interesting to me because in the Sioux, you know, I didn't necessarily, I wasn't Filipino. There was a small Filipino community, but my mother um, was very removed from it because part of her reason for leaving the Philippines is that because she felt alienated from her own land because she had a very troubled upbringing. And so, you know, she was an adventurer and like she left when she was a teenager and she moved to Hong Kong, and, which wasn't any better. She has so many stories of just racial aggressions and what happened to her there. And, and she met my dad and they fell in love and it was this big little mermaid romance. And then she moved to Canada. And then, you know, she, I was never raised as like, oh, you're Filipino. Oh, you're this. My mom would always just say, you're Emmanuel. This is who you are. This is who I am. And I'd come to her and be like, mom, all these things are happening, which I know now are racial aggressions. And then my mother being like your classic 20 something immigrant who like, you know, sees these things happening to her, but with the privilege of 20 some years of living amongst people who are mostly, you know, of her own race, I'd be like, mom, this thing happened. And she would just give me this weird look like, why like, people are so stupid, whatever. Just never, don't even pay attention to it. I don't understand. I'm too busy. I don't understand. I don't have time for this. And then she would just pretend like it was just like, oh, no, they're just dumb, sweetie. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Instead of sitting me down and like explaining things to me. And then, you know, it was that situation again where I just made these books and suddenly people were coming to me, expecting me to be able to have, to have this discourse and using words like mm -hmm. BIPOC and POC. And I was like, I'm from Sioux, St. Marie. Um, they kill animals up there. We have a steel plant. <laughs> well, like, I don't, I don't know what to say to you. And then obviously after time, educating myself and learning and having the privilege of like making friends and communities who were able to kind of point me in the right direction. And then so like now here we are, you're like in this space where you're like, yeah, like this is, this is what I guess like I'm a part of the conversation now, like what is Filipino literature and what is Filipino community, especially because like my Filipino, it's hard for me to say that because so many of my stories, I don't see them as being inherently Filipino because I, I don't speak any of the languages I wasn't taught to. Um, I barely get to talk to my family because plane tickets are expensive. 
and he, like you know I just feel so removed from all of it and yet like I'm I kind of consider myself sometimes like as like raceless because I'm like white people know that I'm not white but then BIPOC people know that I'm not BIPOC so what am I and then again to be a part of that conversation which I'm starting to learn like which is a big conversation for Filipinos in general because you have Spanish Filipinos you have Chinese Filipinos you have Filipino Filipinos who come from like you know um, like the tribes and then you have um, other mixtures of Japanese Filipinos you have white Filipinos so it's it's like this whole other conversation that then comes up of like you know what does it mean to be Filipino what does it mean to be a part of the conversation but anyway, I'm rambling I had a very long answer for that because I'm still trying to not at all <laughs> that was it's great <laughs> don't apologize well I'm kind of I'm kind of like a, a, a mix of Emmanuel and her mother I, I guess <laughs> because um I'm, I'm like your mother I, I left well I left when I was 16 and so I grew up in the Philippines surrounded by Filipinos so even when went to North America and I was literally the only Filipino in the mall for you know for a long time um I never sort of thought about it or was affected by it um, because I was already grown I moved to Canada I was 21 so I was already grown um and if any racial things happened to me I probably didn't even notice or was oblivious to it because I'm pretty much a pretty oblivious person so then my kids are like you because then they would you know they went to this all white you know school french school and uh they they're they're mixed race they're my my husband is a white and um they so they would experience more things i never experienced growing up you know certain remarks or and then they would let me know about it and i'd be like really I don't know this person's just being dumb or whatever. I'm sure they didn't weren't thinking or I just kind of dismissed what they were saying. Um, and I didn't. I'm not like you're half Filipino. It's only now, like in the last few years, they're so into their culture and heritage half uh, because everything is being celebrated, which is which is great. So um, when I made my book, I I was just and it was a, a while ago now. Um, yeah, I started it, I think over 10 years ago, it was really more for therapy because uh, I was still getting over the death of my father, which is what I wrote about in my book. And, um, I had really just meant to draw it, you know, started drawing it exactly like in the book. I just started drawing it, telling stories about him and my family. And then uh, it became this book and I said, okay, I'll, my kids will have something to read. At least they'll know a bit about their you know, their history and the culture and so on. And, but there was always a part of me inside saying, oh, what if, what if it got published? Wouldn't that be great? But primarily it came out of that, just this desire to um, tell my story to my kids. And, and then something came up from that. And then uh, um, I sent it around and Conundrum Press picked it up and published it as is very fortunate. Like that never happens, I know. So, um, you know, I consider myself very lucky for that. And then all of a sudden now, yeah, uh, I, I attended this event before COVID, uh, something like this, a Filipino, um, you know, in, in downtown in Montreal, drawn in quarterly. They brought all this food. It was organized by, I believe, um, someone mentioned or Eleanor mentioned or Mel Melinda, Melinda I I Jesus, is, is that her? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so she, so I was just sort of a guest. And I was amazed. I was like, wow, because I'm not part of a Filipino community here where I live. I live out in the country and um, I'm kind of not like unlike unlike many of you in Winnipeg who like are surrounded by community. I'm not and my whole family is still in the Philippines. So um, I, I do feel a bit isolated. So this is always like a tree like oh wow <laughs> there's all these filipinos here and uh and it and so th that didn't really inform my writing um as thinking of myself in that way uh at all it was it came from a much more personal just trying to tell my story mm -hmm. and uh, only now i'm like oh i mean i think i think i've given the same answer as april and emmanuel I, only now i'm going uh, oh there is a community uh so that's great. Yeah. 
So interesting. Uh, I've actually been doing some reading on critical theory and I came across, oh God, I can't remember their names right now. I'm gonna embarrass myself. Same people who wrote about racial melancholia. And I remember the first name, the, the, one of the author's name is Aang. Anyways, uh, the critical term is racial dissociation. So anyways, there's this text that I've been reading about um, how there may not be a dominant or readily available language to talk about race or to talk about um, immigrant, immigrant experience. And so um, there's a level of dissociation from one's experiences because they can't talk about it. They don't even know they can't talk about it because there's no language for it yet. You know what I mean? Um, and then, um, I mean, this is why I like the, like the theory because I'm an English person, you know, a literature person, but this theory sort of says, that's why literature is so important because once a text gets published and circulated, it starts a conversation and then the language starts building up to talk about, you know, what before had been dissociated from or what couldn't be recognized. Um, and so it's just funny because I've been reading this text, you know, and it's very abstract and critical. And then, you know, I hear your responses and I think, oh no, that's, you know, that's the phenomenon of uh, maybe racial dissociation, you know, but then you just, what I found so interesting about your answers is that like you wrote the text and then it's the conversation that sort of came up around the text and the investigations that yourself, you know, had when reflecting upon the text that maybe, you know, uh, I was just thinking about Emmanuel saying, you know, it was only after I started going to interviews and people were saying, you know, you're a Filipino writer, you know, what does it mean to be a person of color in Canada or what, you know, and then just to answer those questions, you had to like look at your book a different way or develop a conversation around it or develop the language to uh, talk about it. And then that language, um, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I, I just uh, really appreciate those answers. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I did have a, a question for, for April um, because I'm very much interested in the writing process uh, of, of the Blue Road. So did you receive the text from Wade Compton complete or was it more like a back and forth where you would get back parts of the text and then illustrate it and send it back to him? And, or did, did some of his text change based on, you know, what you had illustrated? How did that narrative develop? Yeah, um, so Wade, like I had worked with him a couple times before on smaller things. Like I, I kind of illustrated a short story for him and um, I'd known him for a bit. And then he asked if I wanted to work on this. So he sent me the script um, basically finished because it was based on a short story that he had written like a while, like 20 years previous. So he turned it into a script and then I said, yeah, like after reading it, I was like, yeah, I would love to work on this with you. Um, and then after talking to the publisher and doing all of that, we, I thumbnailed the whole book. Like I, I did roughs for the whole book. Um, and in that process, because it was Wade's first time writing like a graphic novel script, like he's an amazing writer, but he'd never done a script before. So it was a little bit of me being like, hey, just, you know, like this page, I'm going to be, um, I feel like it'd be better if we took some words away. <laughs> um, just because he'd, he'd never had that experience of being like, oh, actually there's a drawing and the drawing says the same thing as the words here. So we don't need the words for this um, or vice versa. You know, like it's such a relationship between the words and pictures. It's like a unique relationship. Um, but yeah, after thumbnailing and roughing like the whole book, Wade, it kind of made Wade realize like, okay, we need an extra section here. So there is like a whole extra, I think it's like five or six pages um, that weren't there that added like a little bit of context. 
um, for her back, like the main character's background um, that came about because he saw the whole thing laid out visually. Um, so that was an interest, like it was interesting to watch that happen and have a little bit of, um, have a little bit of a part in that. It, it was, yeah, really fun. It was so interesting because it happened over the course of months, you know, like that conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, did I, did I miss any part of your question? I'm trying to think. I don't think so. I'm just okay. happy when anyone answers. <laughs> I don't have like I don't have like a, a clear direction in my question you know I just really yeah. hear what you what you think you yeah know? yeah no it was um it was a back and forth which was nice Wade was very like very flexible whenever I would suggest a change um because I'd be like let's just like not have words here <laughs> let's just have a picture <laughs> I can relate with Wade there because I don't really have any um, familiarity with graphic um, novels. And actually when I did the reading to prepare for this panel, it was a really, really um, eye-opening experience for me. You know, my eyes were like going all over the page and I thought, oh, I just wonder how these texts get written because the, the illustrations are such an integral part of the story. And so I was just wondering about that collaborative process. Um, yeah, it's definitely like a specific writing format. And I feel like it's similar to how like if you're writing children's books, like you have to write it like in a specific way. You can't approach it the same way that you would like a YA novel or like, I don't know, adult literature or something, but yeah. Um, I have a question here in the chat um, about, about in writing your, your comics, I should call them graphic novels, sorry. Um, did you feel a desire to rebel against the label Filipino Canadian or against another label or, you know, against being labeled different or other? I? Yeah, absolutely. For anyone. <laughs> well, I didn't, uh, I feel like I should have probably mentioned this in my bio, but I wasn't thinking I like copied and pasted it from something else. But uh, in one of my more recent, just like web comic series that I posted for me more than anything, I kind of unpack what it means to be of two races and therefore of no races at all. You know, it's so tough for me because I'm constantly labeled as like a Filipino creator and yet I don't necessarily like I, I don't I don't want to say like I feel like it's a lie but it's more like not in a way where I'm like that's not true I'm angry more it's like no like I don't feel that I've earned the right to be called a Filipino creator but then like I'm definitely not white so <laughs> I don't feel that I have the privilege to say that either and so I'm like in this like amorphous space and like when you talk about like rebelling I guess like I made it was for a pitch for a larger series but like kind of trying to channel all of those really confused like you mentioned and I wrote it down um but like racial disassociation and like kind of the struggle that people face when they have all these feelings and emotions particularly like particularly to do with race and your feelings around them and how you're viewed by others and viewed by yourself and not have the language or the understanding and it feels almost like you're trying to reach for something but it's not there and that's what comics has always been for me. Like you see it in my other comic, like I have all these feelings as a little girl and I'd just be like, your feelings are the jungle, you're in the jungle and you're fighting a tiger and you're, you're Tarzan and you're swinging through the vines because I couldn't just sit down and be like, you're really stressed out right now because your mom's yelling about stuff you don't understand. Mm -hmm. So you're channeling that rage by fighting imaginary creatures, you know? And like as a, I guess like combating that, it's tough because you always want, at least in me, there, there's two sides of me. There's a part of me that wants to break out and be like, I'm not a label, I'm me, I'm my person. But then people are like, what does that mean? And I'm like, I'm going to get back to you. I'll have it one of these days. I'll, I'll put a finger on it. And when I do, you'll know, you'll be the first to know. 
<laughs> which is not an answer. And then also like on the other side, I'm like, then it sounds like I'm being ungrateful because like, it's like all my life, I felt like I was looking for like my place and my label, but then I found my label and I'm like, but is that my label kind of deal? And then there's that part of me, I guess, like the Filipino side, that's like, you should just be grateful. You have anything at all <laughs> kind of, you know, you should just be like happy that you finally do have something. It's more than nothing and it's a great place to start. But I think it is like, because we're in a time where so many people, like a lot of labels are coming out, not just like, you know, in the sense of like racially, but you have a lot of like LGBTQ plus labels and there's so many more discussions that are coming out where people finally have the space to kind of be like, who am I? What am I? What does it mean? Yeah. And yeah. I was just gonna say, you know, uh what I hear you saying is it's sort of like a double-edged sword in a way, you know, because on one hand, the label allows you to start the conversation and to start exploring what that is. On the other hand, it can become too fixed or stereotypical or, or, or box you in too much. I also hear like a lot in your conversation about like, you know, differences between generations. Like I'm fourth generation Chinese Canadian and I'm mixed race. And uh, it's, it's really complex, you know, um, the differences between the generations and maybe the coping mechanisms and the different consciousnesses of different, you know, generations when it comes to topics like race, you know. Um, so there's, there's just differences also between generations, but there's also differences sometimes in like phenotype, right? Um, so I can pass as white, but my mom can't. Um, and so there's a lot of experiences when I was growing up of like people just, ex you know, sort of exclaiming sort of shock that that was my mom. And now that my mom has grandchildren, um, sometimes she's mistaken as the nanny. And, um, you know, so there's, I would just say that like being mixed and passing as white can sometimes help you see you know, you see your mother or you see someone related to you who is racialized, go through racialized experiences that you don't have to, but you are emotionally connected to that person. So you feel it very viscerally, you know? Um, and so there, it's a very unique perspective to be, you know, second, third, fourth generation, but also mixed race. Doesn't mean that you are disconnected from from racialized conversations or, or what you observe. Rena, I have a question for you. Oh wait, can I can I answer oh, that? Of one? course. Okay, okay yes, of course. Sorry. Please respond. I, I love I love what Emmanuel said because I mean I I I feel the same way. I'm not mixed race. I'm I'm all Filipino. Um, but I've never the word is not rebel. Um, it's just I've sort of it's like my hair is, you know, my hair is black or whatever. And, and it's like, I forget about it. That, that's basically, it's like I'm reminded only when people remind me. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I'm like, oh yeah, it is, my hair is black. Oh yeah, I am Filipino. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's honestly how I've sort of felt all my, all my life ever since I moved to the States, even when we were living in the States and I went to, I started off going to this public school in Virginia and um, not many, you know, Asians there, but I don't know. I just wasn't as maybe sensitive to that kind of thing. I would just went to school and if people said something, I was probably oblivious to it. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just kind of been my life. And, and, and it was just like that. I lived in Canada, surrounded by white people in my neighborhood, Didn't, never thought about it. Honestly, just sort of, I'm just me. My husband and I don't, I'm just me to him. And then, and then I went through that whole traumatic thing when my dad died. And then ironically, because I wrote a book about my life in the Philippines with culture and politics and all that, um, it, it was almost like the universe's way of, of forcing me to not acknowledge, because it's not that I didn't acknowledge, it's just I didn't think about it. It wasn't, it wasn't important to me. It was just there, something I took for granted. Uh, my heritage and uh, I still do to this day um, I'm just it's it's just like a part of me that's not the most important part if I can say that um, I know it is to many people which is also fine 
you know, but to people who it's not the most important thing, just like if your your um, your gender is not the most important thing about you or your whatever, um, that's fine too. And and I, I guess I'm kind of rambling on like you, uh, Emmanuel. But but I guess I just feel like <laughs> it's not that I don't want to be labeled. If someone labels me as that, I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. But mm -hmm. I myself don't put a label. I don't put a label on myself. And, and that's because I'm not searching anymore. And I can understand if people are searching. So I, you know, I, I feel fortunate that I'm not. I don't have those feelings of, uh, you know, who am I? Uh, why am I here or whatever? Um, but I'm old. So, you know, maybe that's why. But, but I've always been that way. Even when I was young, I was that way. I didn't really think about that stuff. And, and that's fine too, isn't it? <laughs> I think maybe sometimes people feel they ought to be thinking of those things more. Maybe they feel a pressure. Oh no, everyone's talking about that. Maybe shouldn't I be? And I get, get maybe I want to be the voice for people who it's it's sort of not a thing. Maybe um, I, I don't know if I'm making sense here, but but um, yeah. There you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't apologize. I think it's like the rebellion thing and I think it's yeah. not so much the rebellion is like yeah like uh it's more just like sometimes like when I wrote the book I was kind of a little annoyed because I'm like great good yeah I know I'm half Filipino what else like what about just the book itself like, yes book? yes I'm like no I do I respect that I'm a part of this great culture and it's magic yes and it's things, but like just like what about the art <laughs> yeah <laughs> what about my storytelling <laughs> yeah like tell me like about yeah. like does it always have to relate back to like a racial thing can it just yeah be, like, you know me out in the world yeah 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 I, I I so get you like like I mean it was primarily about my grief for my father me feeling you know losing myself and and all those sorts of feelings you know um so it's nice to talk about that stuff too uh and my love of pop culture so yeah <laughs> it was a bit interesting for you because like this came from such a vulnerable place and then instead of you, like as an artist this is like I guess like the selfish part of being an artist is because you want your audience to be like so sorry for your loss and like, I'm just, like, kind of be like oh I connected with your father and this and that and they're just like so you're Filipino right <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind that honestly I, I I love it all I I think I'm my 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 point is really it doesn't feel more important than all the other things that that's that's what I mean it's 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 part of who I am just like I love soccer. That's part of who I am, you know. Um, or I love this, or you know, it, it's just part of who I am. That's all. That's mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. It's so interesting. I like. I love um, hearing all of this because I feel like, in some ways, I had a very different um, experience. My mom was super proud to be Filipino. Like she came over to Canada in 1989. And like growing up, she was always like, you're Filipino. Don't ever let anyone tell you you're not Filipino. And she'd always be just, so I was raised like very proud of being Filipino. And then I think it was like, again, an unlearning of like, well, okay, actually like you're half white and that's a privilege to be like light skinned and all of these things. And like, yeah, I don't know. I do feel like, I do feel like being Filipino is really important to me. Um, and she like, did so many things that I'm grateful for now where she like refused to talk to me in English and she only ever talked to me in Tagalog um, that. so that now I can like I can understand it and I can speak it brokenly but but I think it was like a struggle for me through like my teen years where I was like what does it mean like you know I went through the whole like what does it mean because I'm half what does it mean <laughs> Um, and I think it has also settled for me where I'm just like okay this is part of me and like it's really important but it's like there's also like more and that's totally okay. Yeah. How much time do we have, Luke? Well, um, let's see. I think we are scheduled to wrap up at uh, at, at three fifteen, but we could end a little bit earlier um, if, if we. Oh no, I have you. another but, question. But not, yeah. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to dominate everyone's yeah. time. But if there's more time, I will take it up because I do. Let's aim for three fifteen, but but go to the you, right. 
You had okay. a question. You said you had a question for me, Lindsay, before I, I went on that raw, long rambling answer there. No, it's not rambling at all. I find okay. it very fascinating. I almost feel like on the fly, you know, there's this kind of, you know, we're just really getting a sense of the complexity to the identification of Filipino Canadian, you know, um, and that it, um, and, and what it means, <laughs> you know, um, even to uh, different people in the same community, you know, um, and, and there's differences and yet, you know, similarities all at the same time. And I think that's what's so interesting about the conversation and, 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 the, and how fluid it is. But I did have a, a question. Um, because when I was uh, reading your book, one of the most striking um, parts of it for me was this description of like the family and how they lived in a gated community. And then there was a man without feet who was always out front of the um, church and so on and so forth. Um, and, and anyways, there's this commentary in the, in the book about I guess like a sort of awareness of privilege awareness you know that that life can be very hard or um that, that there are very different realities even within that same area that this character is growing up and then it sort of flashes forward to like the future and this uh, character living in Canada and her frustration sometimes with her her children like maybe I'm not raising them right because they're yeah. complaining about having to go to hockey twice a week. And uh, and I'm just wondering about that because there's an interesting dynamic there between generations and, um, and, and there's sort of conversation about privilege and knowing what you have. Um, but then, uh, you know, there's a, I feel like there's a history to the Philippines there that I don't really know. You know what I mean? Uh, when I, I that that also interests me. You know about um, just the the way that a neighborhood you know might be composed. Um, you know, yeah. so I I I don't really have a question there. I'm just <laughs> throwing things. Well, uh, I guess I guess um, when I wrote that, as I said, when I wrote it, it was it was really primarily for for my kids to let my kids know my story. Um, but also very aware that it could, you know, it could have a, a, a larger audience. And it was to point out that there, there was a difference in my upbringing as to what the maybe, you know, a, a lot of uh, other Filipinos upbringing. And just, just to, you know, I mean, to bring it up because my experience is, is not maybe, um, as similar to some, um, but it's still my own personal experience. So I have to write and draw about it. But it was it, it was to also point out that I was aware, um, even as a child, that uh, I came from a privileged background. Um, unfortunately, now for uh, happily, the country is is uh, I think the middle class has grown. But when I was growing up, it was a very small middle class, uh, mostly upper class and very large, you know, um, uh, a lot of a lot of poverty, which is why you have all these immigrants who had had to move abroad, you know, to make a better life for mm -hmm. themselves. Um, but at the same time, that wasn't my story. And I could only write about my story. Um, and uh, I didn't want to be just ignoring that part of our country, because I, I had a privileged upbringing. So all my experiences in my country was not you know, we're, yeah, we, I, I went to party, even, even, even the whole um, being involved in the politics, um, my parents, my relatives, we had a different version, even when we attended rallies, it was from a different point of view. And I just felt the need early on in the book to kind of make that distinction, um, just to show an awareness of, of that. And um, also to bring up later my kids, uh, bring up my kids in the same thing because it does it does make now now they're all grown up so they're 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 not like that anymore. But when they were younger, and uh, they really would complain about things that I felt were so you know 
how dare you? Um, I needed to express that um, because I was aware of it every day. Every day I would drive with my dad through the streets and see people like that poor man and, and these street children. And uh, that was just the reality uh, of, my, uh, of, my, of my own childhood. And so I really felt I needed to, um, to lay that out. Does that answer your question? Or? It does. Okay. That actually sort of um, leads me to a question that I Oh, sorry. I think I'm missing things in the chat. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so just taking over. I'm like, I have another question. There's a question here in the chat um, about uh, for April and uh, for everyone actually on the panel about what you're going to do next um, and what kind of projects and stories you're doing. Um, I am in a writing program right now. Um, I'm just like in a certificate writing program at SFU at Simon Fraser University to hopefully strengthen my writing because I wanted to also work on, um, my mom passed away in 2017. Um, which like, I think it was like the following year I picked up your book, Rina, because you wrote about your dad passing away. Um, but yeah, I would like to work on a graphic novel about visiting the Philippines for the first time in like 24 years. Mm -hmm. I went back with my family um, in 2019 and it was like a year and a half after my mom had passed away. So it was like a really emotional experience because it was like, visiting the motherland but like without my mother um and I hadn't been there since I was four like and the last time I was there I was with her so I'm hopefully like I'm I'm working on turning that into a script because I'd really like to I don't know talk about my mom and my work and like talk about my family um so yeah that's what I'm hoping to be working on and I'm beginning to be working on I'll go next. Um, I'm currently working on like a couple of things. I have a, a series that started off as um, an erotic comic series because I was really interested in how those worked kind of thing and that kind of storytelling, but it's called Princess Bunyi. And um, it's about, you know, being like a Filipino woman and dating and just like all the craziness and the comedy and the silliness of love and romance, but with an interracial romance, um, especially kind of like an awakened, educated way um, and how to navigate that as well as like, you know, self-worth and self-love and, and at least for me, unpacking like the, the Filipino nanny stereotype and like the exoticized woman stereotype, um, all stuff, you know, that I'm just kind of working through and like fun things, more life stories. Um, also, there's like a, we have a sci-fi series on webtoons called Dune Hunters. Again, it's about like the struggle of like mixed and being raceless. And in my time, I was very, very lucky to be an international high school teacher for a hot minute and where, you know, I was given the care of all these um, immigrant kids who were in Canada for the first time. And although they had the very unique experience of being the 1%, like they would come, they would drive to school in their Lexus. And they had their two thousand dollar Versace backpack. They're still teenagers, you know. And then just kind of getting to be like the cool adult in their life that would, unfortunately, then they're like, "Hey, miss, this thing happened to me." And I'm like, "Ooh, that's a microaggression. Let's talk about that." And you know, doing that um, as well as I also have a writing mentor similar to April because I'd like to strengthen my writing skills and just get become a better storyteller and. Um, Hopefully, uh, I would like, there's the, the scene you saw in Eleanor's, um, her, uh, oh my God, her PowerPoint of Melody in the Jungle. Um, it's always been my dream to do my own like Filipino Tarzan. So uh, <laughs> yeah, well, cause I just, as much like Tarzan, I grew up reading it. It's from the 1800s guys. I'm sure you hate that book, <laughs> but it is a very timely piece of literature. Um, but like for what it was at its time, I remember growing up and then later I was like, oh, this is, this is a, not, not a good book, but I'm like, well, what if I were to do it from the perspective of someone who has the privilege of a, you know, who comes from a culture that is within the jungle, that is within the forest and has such a rich 
cast of horrific, horrific mythological creatures and fun stuff. So anyway, someday, working on it. Oh, oh Rena, I think you might be muted. Ah, thank you. Um, I am working on a, a, a book for middle grade readers with more stories, I suppose. Um, but I mean, I don't know if I'll find a publisher. That's the thing about <laughs> this industry. It's, it's, very, uh, it's very competitive. So hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully I'll find a publisher for it. I'm not done yet. It's called Eight Animal Stories. And it's uh, about stories, again, from my childhood um, growing up there, um, <clears throat> and each of them is about uh, an animal in our lives. Uh, and um, anyway, fingers crossed, we'll see. And uh, I'm working on something for an anthology as well. Um, and uh, I have a couple more stories in me still, so uh, so we'll see. I have another question from the chat, and. Um, this person wants to know more about your artistic process and in particular, you know, um, what you might do to, you know, shut off the inner critic, but maybe also, you know, whatever sort of unhelpful feedback or reviewers might also be out there in the world. Okay, I can, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take this first because um, <clears throat> I don't read anything. I don't read any Goodreads. I don't read any of that stuff. Uh, um, because I don't know how it would make me better, um, you know. But actually, I think I think it, the reviews aren't aren't bad. I just don't read them. I just make it a point not to, and because I do, I have a lot of self doubt as it is, and I just tell myself, I just force myself. Like that's what my husband he loves to say that just force yourself, and I force myself to write and draw even when I'm full of doubt. Um, oh, this isn't any good. Even when I feel like this isn't any good, I'm a fraud, there's always something in the back of my head saying, no, it's good. Actually, it's good. And, and maybe it's a defense mechanism. The first part is a defense mechanism, you know. Um, so I would tell people who are creating, uh, uh, you know, even if it'll never get published, just do it. Just force yourself because to have to do it is better than to not do it, basically. And um, like I'm going to finish this book and again I'm telling myself uh, I'll, I'll just finish it and I'll share it with, with my family so that I'm not thinking too much about uh, it might never get published why am I doing this you know um, so I, I just tell myself these helpful sort of practical uh, things to just make me work on stuff um, and if doubt creeps in I just tell myself well even if you're crap just force yourself to do it and you'll you'll feel better. So sorry that was a really um, <laughs> honest answer. <laughs> honest. And not a not a professional answer, but it's an honest answer. What can I say? Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me check the chat. I don't know if I have anything good. To add, I, I think I'm like my own biggest critic also. So I don't know. I feel like I do like reading feedback because I'm just like, okay, like where can I get better? Oh, this is like validating everything I thought about myself. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I feel like I use anything to try and motivate myself to be better, but it's also, it's a dialogue. It's an ongoing dialogue with myself, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I guess for me, I've kind of, I have a very interesting relationship, I guess, with creation. Um, this is probably like the religious Filipino side coming for me, but it's, you know, we were given the gift of creation so that we could mirror back to ourselves, you know, our, our hurts and our happinesses and, and just life. And I realized, you know, so much of my literature, I was always, it was always coming from a place that I'm like, oh, I'm teaching things to people and I'm saving them. And then I realized, I'm like, no, you're trying to save yourself. So for me, even if my work I feel is, like horrible or I have all these horrible thoughts I always remind myself I'm like but is it healing you are you healing it doesn't matter what it looks like it doesn't matter how it reads it doesn't matter if there's 
89 spelling mistakes. My first book was published with 89 spelling mistakes. Oh, the, the editor accidentally sent the wrong version to the printing press. Oh, no. It was so embarrassing. And I was just like, I'm 19. Because <laughs> I was like handing it out at the convention and there was 89 visible spelling mistakes inside of like the first call. Oh, it was really, it was terrible. And I was like, your worst nightmares have come true. This is what bottom feels like. It's only all from here. But um, yeah, I just, I keep telling myself, I'm like, no, if you're happy, and you feel that you're learning something and growing from your own work and it's teaching me, it teaches me about my life and whatever other people think it doesn't matter. It's like what Rena said. She's like, oh, I'm going to share it to my family and my mind. And I was like, who do I want to share my books with? And I, there was like, there's no one because I'm still, you know, I don't have kids yet or a husband. And I was like, I want to share my books with myself. Like, I'm excited to write my own books so that I could read them because that's exciting. So if I could do that, then like, that's a win. I have another question. Um, this one is maybe specifically for April, but available for anyone, you know, on the panel. But what I found so interesting about the Blue Road is that there's this emphasis on, well, even the title is A Fable of Migration. And there's some commentary in the book about, you know, re arriving, returning. Uh, there's a sense of like movement, often we don't think about immigration like that. We think about it like moving from one point to another and now you're in Canada, so you know, you're know you Canadian, right? But there's so much fluidity, fluidity, you know, not just in this book, but in the other books too about like, no, like your family, you still have family over here and then you have family over there. And, and so there's this sort of like transnational, you know, life world, you know, back and forth movements, you know, complicated kind of negotiations, um, um, so I guess I was um, gonna ask a question about um, the Blue Road and, um, you know, um, and about, you know, um, how it's a story of migration or movement and, and why the emphasis sort of on, 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 I forget what the, you know, the new start, Every everything is a new start, returning or uh, arriving. Um, it's a new start, it's a new story. And even the ending of the story is in fact quite open-ended about, you know, what, what could happen next. Yeah, um, I think like, are you talking about the part when Zoe's like, Wade wrote like, leaving, arriving and returning are all just different words for the same thing, starting over again. Yes. Yeah, I know. I love that part. He's so good. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have yeah. like a, wait, do you have like a concrete question? Because I feel like I was just going to talk about, mm -hmm. it made me when I was reading the script and when I was um, illustrating it, it really made me think, of course, about my mom, because actually she always wanted to go back to the Philippines um she was happier there and she was always like I'm a tropical girl I don't belong <laughs> in this cold wintry wonderland um and she would like she went back in 2015 and she was there for maybe nine or ten months and she was so happy um and she was like you know I would move back here if it wasn't for you and your brother I was like okay <laughs> I don't know what to tell you um but she like she loved it and wanted to go back and I do feel like people don't talk about that a lot like about how I don't know immigrants like you know like it's not always like you've come here and it's a better life it's like actually I I enjoyed being back there and that was home and I don't know obviously I don't think that's like my story to talk about because I didn't immigrate here but I do think about that how my mom was like she was like I was happier in the Philippines and I liked it better there and like yeah I don't know it, it is an interesting thing to think about I don't know if Rena, you want to talk about? I don't know if anyone is. <laughs> I'm not too sure also what the question is, but... Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm not great at uh, expressing. Okay. No, you're just bringing threads forward. Yeah, no, it's okay. I, I take it however you want. You know, respond to whatever, <laughs> whatever has been said, you know, whatever you're inspired to respond to. <laughs> Well, I am an immigrant, um, 
and um, but I, I try to go back when I can and um, yeah, I, I find it interesting what April just said that that's not talked about, about like everyone just assumes all oh, everyone here is it's a better life, but there's a lot of, uh, you, you know, you really miss, I find, I find especially when you're Filipino, you really miss the extended family, like the, the feeling of uh, that everyone's just there. But, but at the same time, I think the trade-off is like, I, I, I I live here with my husband and children, pretty isolated. Um, but I find that's also good for me. Uh, like sometimes maybe just being around people constantly, that's great. But then sometimes you also need to take a step away. And I find when I am in the Philippines, <laughs> there's like no room for that. Everybody's just always in each other's <coughs> business, which so I enjoy visiting and then I enjoy coming back here to the relative, um, um, you know, I guess less people, which which is also nice. So I, maybe some maybe other people have the same experience. I think uh, I think uh, it's time for the other panelists to speak now. I guess. Anyway. No, I appreciate that answer. Yeah. And um, there's, I just uh, really appreciate um, this entire panel has been amazing. Is it? I just want to check because we are coming up to time. Um, that um oh i have a reminder here that i need to announce the winners <laughs> of the giveaway so i will do that before i forget okay so the winners of the giveaway are maybell magsino and Relly manzen manansen those are the winners um sorry i yes yes you <laughs> so uh, i guess uh if you heard your name uh you yes uh you heard your name because you won the giveaway um and so i imagine you will have to just sort of um wait to get an email <laughs> after the event okay about um you know uh where where your book should be sent or how you would like to um, receive them. And um, I just wanted to thank everyone on the panel for your uh, wonderful and generous answers. It's just been like a really amazing um, discussion for me. Um, we do have a couple more minutes if there is anything you just want to say, you know, in closing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I I was so honored to be asked um, and just to connect with all of you has been so lovely. Um, I honestly kind of wish we could just keep talking. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know. Understand. I understand we have time limits. <laughs> I think there's something about, you know, being a creative writer and a critical scholar that you need like a certain amount of space and privacy, but then it is so nice to get together with people and, and talk. And, and I just have to say for myself that I really appreciate that you listen to my questions and try to find questions within what weren't really questions, just ideas being thrown at you. And uh, I, just, uh, I just really appreciated the opportunity um, to hear your thoughts and, um, and to learn about your work. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now uh, I, I, I really wish I could have met everyone in person, uh, especially my fellow creators, Emmanuel and April. I, I wish we could have all, you know, been together. That that's like uh, the big regret about uh, about this whole thing is uh, um, it, it's it's so nice to connect with people, uh, especially you know in that way. So thank you so much for for inviting me also and um, you know making me a part of this community. Thank you. Thank yeah, I, will, I also want to say thank you so much. I mean, despite my comments is talking about how I'm like, oh, but like, come on, guys. Me okay. too. <laughs> the time, it's still like, it is it feels so good to kind of, you know, be a part of a community where you feel very seen. And, yes. and so it's, it's really, really wonderful because a lot of the things people talked about, their thoughts that I have in my head that I don't, you know, tell anybody and then hearing other people. Yeah. 
<laughs> me too. I'm not crazy, I'm not crazy guys. Um, me too. So wonderful and so good to yeah. <laughs> you you started it. <laughs> no, but it's still it's so good to it's so good to talk to everybody and even just yeah. be able to talk about that experience where you're both very grateful to be a part of something that's like but there's it's like the Little Mermaid, you know, <laughs> like but there's more questions. There's still so much more out there. Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm really really grateful to be here. Thank you so yeah. much. Everybody. It was Maybe so we'll wonderful to meet you, April and Rena. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, everyone. That was really amazing. I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, listening to that. Uh, congratulations to Relly and uh, Mabel uh, for uh, winning, uh, being the big prize winners. Now, why don't we uh, take a break? Um, let's uh, turn off our cameras and uh, have a sandwich or something, and then come back at 3.30 for our second panel, OK? OK, thank you very much, everyone. See you soon. Actually led to manga and graphic novels. Um, so it's kind of been a thing that's always been there, but never, I never chased after it until recently because I didn't really know that I could do it, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just mainly been a childhood dream, essentially. Uh, yeah, and for me, um, very similar, um, uh, origin story, right, when it comes to just geeking out on, um, whatever anime or comic books. Um, I think um, more specifically, I do love to write and I do love to draw and like, it's just the perfect medium when it comes to um, how I want to tell a story. Um, also just um, what's really special about the comic book medium is um, panel composition, like that's such a unique thing that you don't see in other mediums. Um, how one panel reads to another or just like how you can be creative with um, how tempo and color, like, and I feel like the possibilities are like endless with uh, the medium. And it gets me really excited when I see really great just panel composition. Uh, same thing with, uh, with me. Uh, I, I've been reading comics for as long as I can remember. My dad was a comic book reader. Um, so there were comics all around, you know, all the time. I grew up in Montreal where, you know, we had Bon Dessine in our classrooms and my teachers were <laughs> fans of Garfield and uh, whatever was uh, Ziggy. I don't know if everybody here is old enough to remember Ziggy. Um, so I was always surrounded by, by comics. Um, and I just, I just love the the marriage of words and pictures, and I love to tell stories, and it's it's one, it's my favorite way to tell to tell a story. Thank you all. Um, I should remind everyone that if anyone else has questions, they can put them in the chat. But all of your answers really made me think of my my own childhood. I grew up reading things like Garfield, but also like Archie comics. Um, but when I was, you know, reading these things, none of the characters were really Asian, right? So I'm curious, like, what does it mean to you um, creating in this genre to have Asian representation and like Filipino, Filipino Canadian characters? Well, I, if, I, if I may start, I, I think it's huge. Um, growing up, all of my heroes were white and the majority of them were American. Uh, and being Canadian, <clears throat> it was huge when Alpha Flight came on the scene. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Alpha Flight, but they're the Avengers of Canada in the Marvel Universe. And that was a game changer for me. And it just so happens that two of the superheroes in that comic book are twins from Quebec who, while they're French Canadian, they kind of look elf-like. And to me, I always thought, oh, they might be, they could be part Asian, maybe. That could be me. Um, and I also grew up watching the Super Friends. And um, the Wonder Twins, who are from Exor, a planet, uh, an alien planet, to me also looked Asian. So I was like imposing myself on these characters and thinking, well, you know, they kind of look like me. So that, uh, you know, that counts. But of course, it's not the same thing. Um, I don't even know the first time I remember the, well, actually I do, that's, that's a lie. I mean, I probably discovered, when I first discovered manga and realized, oh, wow, there's the whole industry, right? Um, although I was aware of Filipino comics at the time, comics with a K, 
Uh, but we never saw those heroes in the comics that I was reading. So as soon as I got the opportunity to, again, impose myself, I mean, my very first comic was this thing called The Copybook Tales, which basically was a semi-autobiographical story about myself and my friend Tim Levins, trying to break into the comic industry. So it was very meta. Um, but I think that was the first time that I ever saw a Filipino family in a comic book. I mean, outside of the Philippines, of course. Alan or Joanna? I can go. Um, so for me, I, I honestly didn't really read Western comics. So I, I grew up on manga and anime. So I've essentially always seen at least Asian characters. Um, and I don't know, I just wanted to draw myself as a char in, in my stories. And I, I knew that there weren't many Filipino characters overall in, in pop culture and in media. Like even recently, the only actor that comes to mind in Western media is, uh, oh my God, his name escapes me, the friend from Spider-Man. <laughs> um, he's Filipino, um, but it's just like, there's so much talent from the Philippines, like everyone I know and grew up with loves telling stories and everything like that. So it, it just, it's just always been a thing and comics has always been a thing for me. So it, it only made sense to make my own main characters Filipino. Yeah, and I guess for me, um, like I do consume a lot of media and I really care about the idea of Filipino stories by Filipino artists. Um, if someone is gonna write about Filipinos, if it's not gonna be me, it better be from another Filipino because they have uh, a genuine perception that they have, um, it's just more genuine storytelling, I feel, if a Filipino is writing um, Filipino stories because there's more attention to detail, right? Like when you, as a Fili Filipino draw, a Filipino home, there's going to be things that another person won't draw because um, they didn't grow up with um, certain decorations, right? You might have a Santo Nino there, you might have a spoon and fork, you might have, um, th these are all like kind of stereotypical, but like a lot of it is true and it, it, it creates a genuine setting for when you write the story. Um, also, for me to be able to share parts of Filipino culture that um, here in the di diaspora, we don't really get to see necessarily. Um, in my in Kasama, I like to put um, elements of basketry or tattooing or, um, you know, more than just the food. And um, it's just things that I wanna, Kind of share to other people and if someone's going to share it like it should be a filipino person yeah that's really interesting you bring up like ideas of authenticity and like um that kind of personal experience right like it it's a story for you and other people like you but and and from you um rather than having kind of something imposed on you from the outside Um, yeah, it's interesting that you bring up food because earlier, like um, Eleanor's keynote, right, also brought up this idea of food and culture sharing through food. Uh, are there any questions maybe from the panel? Luke, did you have any questions? Well, I, I, I did have, I did have one. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, one of the reasons I was really excited um, to have the three of you um, together on a panel is it seems as though um, there's some real, really strong connections um, between your work and, and Joanna, from, from what I assume your, your forthcoming graphic novel will, will be. Um, you know, you all deal a lot with, I guess, for, for um, lack of a better word, uh, kind of uh, folklore, uh, especially sort of, uh, you know, the supernatural. And I, and I guess one question that I had was sort of, when did this material kind of become present in, in, in your minds, right? Like, was this stuff that your parents told you, you know, um, 
you gotta gotta come home when it gets dark and stop playing because the Karakara sun is gonna come? Or is this something that you heard from grandparents or aunties? Or, or in fact, is this material that you had to kind of learn from books? Because uh, I, I imagine that people can have pretty different relationships with this sort of um, folk culture. Yeah. Um, for lack of a better term, I was raised pretty white. Um, I technically pronounce my last name incorrectly. My parents told me to pronounce it as cacao, even though in the Philippines it's cacao. Um, so surprisingly, they didn't constantly speak Tagalog to me, so I'm not fluent at all in it. And just exploring my own culture on my own has been a very integral part in putting it into my own graphic novels. And it goes with the different architectures I've put in and the clothing and everything like that. I want to go beyond just because food is always the first thing that people think of when they think of Filipinos. So um, I just wanted to put, <clears throat> sorry, I just wanted to put like other parts of it, like even there are traditional tattoos and everything like that. Yeah, I could go next. Um, yeah, very similarly, um, I kind of had to learn all of this myself. I actually asked my parents and my grandma about Aswang and um, my mom didn't want to talk about it. And when I mentioned it to my grandma, they were like, why do you want to, you know, why do you want to learn about these things? Right. Like, uh, and for them, it's a very serious matter. Um, Cause like, at least my mom's side and they grew up on the countryside. Right. So I'm sure there was this type of superstition there. And um how i started diving deeper into just aswang or just filipino creatures in general is because at one point i wanted to um update my portfolio as an artist and i really couldn't imagine seeing myself diving into other people's cultures right like um especially in video games a lot of the themes are quite repetitive and for me um, I wasn't passionate about what's really popular in the mainstream. So I went into just Filipino folklore. And after reading more about it, I started seeing how some elements in these stories influence um, our mannerisms or even just like um, our expressions, right? Like expressions like tabi tabi po or bahar lakad, like that's all with respect to um, either mythology or folklore. So um, that's how I started diving into it and just like from then on basically became obsessed with um, trying to learn more about Aswan. So for me, uh, what we consider folklore and mythology, uh, as a child I was told was the truth. This was, this shit happened. Uh, my grandmother was considered a faith healer. She's, uh, oh, no. she's not with us any longer, but she lived out in the, um, you know, rural parts of the Philippines in Pampanga and as uh, was mentioned, there's a lot of superstition and, um, you know, belief in the supernatural as the real. So growing up, all of this was real to me, you know, from the Capre to the Mananangal, Aswang. So anytime I visited the Philippines, I was freaked out. I was like ready to break out the rosary right around my neck and hide under a blanket all night if I had to. Um, but at the same time, as a kid, I was fascinated by all sorts of mythology and folklore you know, Greco-Roman, uh, Egyptian, you know, African, um, indigenous people's mythology. So when the time came to, to start telling stories or when I wanted to tell stories of, uh, <clears throat> that involve folklore and mythology, I would take from almost anything. So whether it's like Bigfoot or, you know, Zeus or whoever, and eventually I started pulling in stories for my family. And that's where um, the graphic novel Lola, a ghost story comes from. Um, it's loosely based on stuff I was told that was, that actually happened to my grandma, um, you know, which for the longest time I bought, but I loved it too. Um, so that's sort of always been around, you know what I mean? And uh, of course, now I tell my kids and they're like, how could you believe that? That's just ridiculous, <laughs> right? Because they they grew up with other, other cultures and other uh, realities, so. Thanks, um, so interesting to hear like your your personal experience with um, mythologies and different mythologies and kind of like the fantastical it's like such a integral part of so much of 
the work that you guys um, create. So this kind of leads me to another question, like what is it that the fantastical offers you that something more realistic doesn't? In when you're when you're creating these stories and when when you're when you're um, you know like presenting them to readers or viewers. Um, well, for me, I've just always been part like I I I don't necessarily like normal settings and stories. I've always been into just anything with powers or magic or anything like that. Um, so I never really. I don't know. When I was a kid, I would always just imagine myself in magical worlds anyway. So it only made sense to make my very first story about a magical world. Um, and that was how I kind of <laughs> decided. <laughs> it's uh, it's fun, right? Um, why do we read fiction at all? I mean, we could watch the news or documentaries. And if you're going to read fiction, you might as well go, you know, all the way, as uh, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's not, obviously it's not particular to Filipinos. I mean, every culture has it. I mean, the American comic book industry, you know, relies so much on other mythologies. Um, and I think, that, again, the best fiction, the best novels and movies and, you know, TV that I consume involves some kind of incorporation of mythology or adaptation of, you know, folklore and, and that sort of thing. So I think it just boils down to making it more interesting than you know coronation street with apologies to people who like coronation street <laughs> right i want to see dragons and stuff uh for me it's just how we can use the fantastical for just symbolism right for harder conversations so um i do as much as possible try to organize with the local uh, Filipino community in Montreal and a lot of what we do is like um, like some decolonization work basically and these types of conversations aren't really accessible to um, just people in general let alone um, Filipinos first generation Filipinos right so um, the Munanangal for example it's like it's for me it was basically begging to be used as symbolism, right? Like if you translate it literally to English, manananggal means like the taker or the extractor. And um, like in my head, I was like, man, this is a no brainer, right? Like let's use uh, elements of um, folklore to talk about issues that are very hard to discuss with, even within family. And, um, you know, it's just my way of making the conversation more accessible. Oh, Lindsay, you have a question. Please share. And I'm so sorry, it's going to be a typical Lindsay question. Uh, <laughs> and that it's not going to be a question. I'm just, I'm just going to ramble for a while. Um, but I just, there's some similarities in what you're um, speaking about <clears throat> to some books that I've read in Chinese Canadian literature. So I'm kind of like glancing up at like Eleanor Tai's picture because <laughs> she probably can back me up on this. But there's, you know, like maybe a trend of sort of gothic type imagery or uh, language and some Chinese Canadian literature. In particular, I'm thinking about Wei Sun Choi and his mother always talked about the buckwai, like a ghost, right? And um, there actually have been some criticisms that like maybe Wei Sun Choi is self-orientalizing himself, you know, um, by perpetuating certain ideas about Chinese people being superstitious or um, inscrutable or, or something, right? Um, but then um, there's some other really interesting interpretations about how the Bakwai becomes this really important vehicle for Wei Sun Choi to understand whatever his parents couldn't express to him or whatever his the previous generations couldn't articulate. Um, like, cause the mother doesn't want to tell him, doesn't, wants to keep him a mono, wants to keep him a, 
doesn't want to disturb them or weigh them down by whatever sort of trauma or disturbing things might have happened in the past. And yet she has to express it somehow. So it becomes stories about the book why. So I'm just uh, wondering to what extent, you know, when we talk, talk about mythology and um, folklore, a lot of times like really dark or violent things happen, but then they can get worked out somehow, you know, and so it becomes a way of articulating something that, uh, and working through something. Uh, I think this is sort of picking up on what Alan's saying without, without actually having to it's like passing on knowledge and passing on some of that experience without re-traumatizing or, 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 or it becoming too much for the next generation to, to contend with. I just wonder what you think about uh, that kind of idea. The, the thing is that's all inherent in mythology and folklore and fairy tales. That's why they were written in the first place, right? Either as cautionary tales or ways to explain the world around us in unscientific because they didn't know the, you know, they, we didn't have the science at the time or they didn't have the science at the time, right? So the moon was, you know, described as such because they didn't know what the moon actually was. Or, you know, Beauty and the Beast is a cautionary tale about, you know, your wedding night because young girls and their mothers at the time don't talk about that kind of thing. So they put it in, they, they mask it in a fairy tale. So basically what we're doing is we're kind of reverse engineering that and reappropriating, you know, the Manangal story or the Capri story into something modern or personal. Um, so, and, and like I said earlier, that every culture does that, right? From the dawn of time. So all these stories were, all of them originated for those very reasons. So it makes perfect sense that they're still being applied the same way today. Right, it's in their DNA. That's why. That's why they exist to, in the first place. Yeah, and like to briefly add to that, like I think, uh, at least for me, my approach to Mananagal or Aswang in general is still in a spooky way because I have just discovered them, or I'm still internalizing them. But like, if you look at um, how they're portrayed in the Philippines now, like they're kind of treated in a whole bunch of unique creative ways, right? Like uh, like robe, like mech, mecha manananggas and just like, um, like the manananggal over there is like how we treat the vampires now, right? Like it's a whole new perception of what a vampire can be. Um, maybe as like diasporic Filipinos, because we're rediscovering this, like it's still maybe, um, treated as like cautionary tales, but like we're also adjusting it, reappropriating it and like evolving the Manananggal, right? We, and we might be a bit behind from like the homeland, um, but ultimately like, uh, yeah, going on with what uh, Jay Torres was saying, like we're just, um, just kind of reappropriating it. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, everyone comes from a different perspective. So you're going to take the same mythology in a different way and see it in a different light. And at the same time, there's really very little that's new under the sun. So you're going to want to do something different with it. So whether it's a Mananangal as a mech, which I think is just brilliant, <laughs> uh, or, you know, a superhero Aswang or whatever it is, someone's going to come along and do, you know, put their own twist on it, which is what makes all of these things more uh, relevant right and keeps it going throughout the ages because eventually we'll get bored of, I mean everyone's bored of being the beast right everyone's bored of red, little red riding hood so you want the new thing to come along or a new twist on I don't think of it or at least for my story I don't think of it as like folk tales it's more so I've made them into creatures um because in in uh like just general pop culture media that West, Western people, Western audiences are used to, we, they've never really heard of an Aswang, for example. Um, so it's just to its core, that's what I'm planning to incorporate into my story. Um, so kind of like leading off of that and thinking about what Jay said about how these 
um, like folklore explain things to people. Um, your your texts are generally for for young people, and so historically, texts for young people have been didactic, right? Like they're meant to teach lessons to young people about like the world or how to how to live. So I'm wondering what sort of lessons maybe are included in your works that uh, are for young readers, like teaching young people about Filipino or Filipino Canadian um, culture or teaching like young Filipino people or young Filipino Canadians about maybe their place in the world or like your own experiences as, as young people. Um, I, I don't, I don't usually set out with that kind of, uh, a goal or a mandate. I just tell a story that somehow was inspired by something else. So for example, I was talking about Lola earlier, you know, I was inspired by my, my own grandmother. Um, my very first comic book was about me and my friend, Tim graduating from college and trying to make our way into the industry. But since the, one of the main characters was Filipino. So then you had the Filipino family and going to church and you know doing all these things that we did pointing with our lips or whatever it was um so i i suppose if you're writing a story the right way your character goes through an arc with some growth and with that growth especially if you're talking about a younger protagonist um with that comes some kind of life lesson uh but that's not, I, I mean i don't start out that way right the hope is you get there and the hope is that kids will pick that up as they as they enjoy the ghost stories and the superheroes and whatever else is going on yeah my story is um i don't think i focus on that either it's more so the relationships between all the characters and it's not necessarily uh filipino centric but it's what i'm used to and what i've grown up with with my family and everything like that and just i find that the Filipino communities, especially, they just, they're, some, they're more tight knit from what I've experienced, at least where I am. Um, and I definitely want to kind of even just, I also feel at the same time within the Filipino community, when they look outside, they're very like judgmental. So like, there's a very, it, it's like a, it's a B story in my story, but um, just like, figuring out different class systems and like the rich looking down at the at the poor and everything like that because like there's like a lot of my titas for example have like name brand purses and they have to be like oh look at my Tory Burch and oh look at my Prada and stuff like that and you're just like I pay $20 for my glasses <laughs> and it's just uh that's what I want to kind of showcase I guess I guess for me, I did kind of approach it um, wanting to give out a message because um, before writing the graphic novel, I was doing kind of, um, I was organized, right? So I was first and foremost um, working with elders and like trying to uh, help people when it comes to migrant worker rights and stuff like that. So ultimately, um, my message does, well, the book, um, I hope to communicate messages um, that um, kind of questions your positionality um, when it comes to facing different um, types of Filipinos, um, whether that be you facing Filipinos back home, uh, you facing other Filipinos here in the diaspora. So yeah, for me, it's really, I guess, message heavy. Uh, and it's kind of funny to see these different perspectives when it comes to our approaches to writing. Yeah, for sure. It's so interesting to think about how different people go through that process, like any kind of creative process. We have a, speaking of like young people and, and process, uh, we have a question from Tim's nine-year-old Filipino son, who's very into comics, and he wants to know how you all got started. Uh, like, did you go to art school? Um, I went to Red River College to go into 3D animation because that was the only thing in Winnipeg. Um, and I found out I didn't like it. Um, but 
as a kid, I always made my own comics, even if they were just like, here's a dog trying to eat a cookie or something. Um, so it wasn't necessarily how did I start with it? It's how I broke out into the industry, I guess. And what helped a lot was uh, finding a, a community around the same level that I was. Um, and most of them are from the States. So they actually gave me a lot of uh, advice and um, insight into American publishing and how you could actually get an agent and get published and stuff like that. Oh, I guess I'll go if that's okay. Um, you know, the very first comic I ever published uh, was a comic strip that I wrote and drew for the school newspaper when I was in grade three. And something about that planted a seed in my head. Like the, the response, it was ridiculous. It was about a bowling ball or something, if I recall correctly, and some pins that just wouldn't go down. I thought that was hilarious. And I guess a, some other people did as well. Um, and the response to that was so enthusiastic that I think it planted the seed in my head. Now in the great, you know, third grade, you're not thinking about careers or whatever, but because I, I, I was a big comic book reader, big comic book fan, as I got older and realized that I wanted to write, um, this was the genre, this was the medium that I wanted to, to write in. Um, so as I mentioned before, my very first comic book was called The Copybook Tales, which is about um, these two kids coming out of college, trying to break into the industry. And that was how I got started. We, it was basically a, a zine, a mini comic, you know, a do-it-yourself comic, photocopied at uh, Kinko's or the library or wherever, um, folded and hand stapled and sold for a dollar on consignment at whatever bookstore or comic shop would take it. Um, and that's how it started. Um, from there, we were sort of discovered by a publisher out in San Jose called SLG Publishing, who wanted to publish the comic as a quote unquote real comic book. And at the same time, I was making submissions to all sorts of companies, big and small. Um, and eventually uh, I got work as a freelance writer and one thing led to another. And I found myself with, a, I mean, it took a number of years, but I eventually found myself working as a, a comic book writer full time. Uh, for me, I'm kind of a late bloomer, actually, like, um, I have been drawing ever since I was a kid, but like, to take it seriously was maybe six or seven years ago. Um, like, the only, like, in terms of serious schooling, like, I'm technically an engineer, you know what I mean? And at one point, I was just like, I'm not enjoying this. Um, let's try doing something I actually do like doing, right? Um, um I basically started well I've like I draw small comic strips here and there but like my first big project was basically Kasama um and as mentioned previously like a big part of that was me wanting to update my artist portfolio and me looking into Filipino culture and me uh obsessing into different just art forms within Filipino culture, connecting with community, connecting with other Filipino artists. Um, so, and then, you know, eventually having a body of work, which uh, made me comfortable enough to sh like share to, other, you know, different publishers. Um, shout outs to Daisy D who is uh, in, the chat right now, she uh, of Anak Publishing, and uh, shout outs to Deanne, who is also in the chat right now. Like, she was one of the people who kind of, you know, we talk about starting, but what's also really important is continuing and having the support structure that will, you know, give you motivation or the advice to keep going. Like, especially if these are other artists and people you trust, right? So, um, apart from starting, like, just being able to get like a strong Filipino artist network um, for me. That's so interesting to hear your different story. Uh, Eleanor has a question. Go ahead, Eleanor. Thank you. Um, I was just interested in the three of you, how, you're, um, how you use technology and social media, because I know a lot of artists are now um, sharing work either on the web or else I know that I know that you have also Instagram accounts 
And I know that some comic artists have become really successful first by sharing their work on Instagram and then getting a, a book contract out of it. So I'm just wondering if you could speak just broadly about either social media or inter internet or web comics and maybe how that might also expand audiences in terms of reaching to other Filipinos, either in the diaspora like, or in the Philippines even. Um, so I've always drawn digitally. Um, I don't like drawing tr traditionally and then I think it's because it hurts my hand. Um, so digital art has always been my medium. And in terms of social media, um, I did start a webcomic and it was when it was posting, it was actually one of the top five romance genres um, on Tapas. It used to be called Tapastic, but now it's Tapas. Um, but that was overall a very interesting way to get at least get my name out because I even printed the book and sold it in Winnipeg conventions. And it was so fun to get Filipinos to come up to me and be like, I love your work. Um, but I definitely think social media plays an integral role, but it's also important to not just purely focus on that because at a certain point, you will probably get too busy to even go on social media um, because right now I'm working on like two bucks at the same time and I'm only on Twitter like every other day. I find it important for just like meeting new artists or just finding new artists, right? Like um, it just enriches your visual library. Um, it's important to see um, who's out there and what they're doing. Like um, because of social media, I was able to uh, you know, get my hands on the books of several of the panelists here, even, you know, before uh, being introduced to them today, right? So um, it's just a great way to kind of see um, who else is doing work and just expand the network. Because, um, yeah, there's, there's really not that many of us, um, at least who are visible. So I think it's important that, you know, there's some kind of connection that's made. So I've been at this a long time. And from a pragmatic standpoint, practical standpoint, technology has transformed the way I work and how I do business. Um, like I come from a time where, I'm talking really old already, where you physically had to go to New York or LA or Chicago or Toronto, I was in Montreal at the time, if you wanted to get work, if you wanted to get notice. Um, there was a lot of networking involved, not that there isn't anymore, but to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I have not gotten work from uh, any meetings or face-to-face -face encounters in the last five, 10 years. It's all been by email, phone, and actually mostly email <laughs> and even text. And I, I come from an era, here we go again, old man talking here, where we used to have to mail shit, like <laughs> scripts and pages and FedEx stuff and wait. Um, and you know, if you're working for like a Marvel or a DC, it's like an assembly line. So you have to wait for the page to go from the penciler to the inker or wherever back to the editor, get photocopy sent back to me to proof. And then, you know, fax, do you guys know what a fax machine is anymore? Fax um, my notes back to the editor and back, right? But now, and so that would take, I, I don't even remember, two months? to do like a 20 page story, maybe even more with if FedEx screws up and loses the artist pages. But now because of digital, every I could send the script out and within a few days, if, you know, a pencil artist gets the line work out there, five or six people can be working concurrently on the same page. And it goes a lot faster. Now there's good and bad to that, obviously, um, but it's just fantastic. I, I remember, this is an old man story again, sorry. I remember Tim Levin, my very first, the very first artist that I ever worked with. He lived in Toronto at the time. I lived in Montreal. I'm like, imagine if we could like talk on the computer with each other and you could see the pages I'm drawing and give me notes. Like we were, it, I, I wish I invented this before it came about. Uh, and here we are, right? So, okay, so there's that, the practical, um, you know, the day-to-day -day kind of work stuff. But 
as I'm sure a lot of you have learned in the last two years during the pandemic, like this is, is huge. Like what we're doing right now is a game changer. Um, I mean, I do a lot of school and library visits generally, but of course during the pandemic, you know, couldn't get out. Um, but in the last year I've done maybe, you know, one or two school or library visits a week via Zoom and, um, you know, Steam work or whatever else it is. Um, so that, that's huge. That's a game changer in terms of getting out there. Uh, I just, I did, um, please forgive me, TD Book, oh my goodness, TD Book Week uh, last year, which normally is a thing where they send authors and artists to different um, regions in the, in the country. And then you'll, do, you'll get into a car and you'll drive from town to town, school to school. And usually you're stuck in one place, right? So the first time I ever did it, I was out in Manitoba. So this year, however, um, I was able to, in the morning, do a Zoom with a class in BC. And then right after that, a class in Winnipeg. And then right after that, a class in Toronto, which you can't do physically, right? So again, another game changer in, the, in terms of getting your work out there and, and whatever. Um, and lastly, I don't want to keep going here, but so I, I, I'm working with uh, um, a Filipino creator named Sigmund Tori, who's putting together an anthology. And he's, 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 uh, he used to live in Toronto, but now lives in Boracay or thereabouts. And just the fact that we are able to DM each other on Instagram about this anthology, um, and he's able to organize it with Filipinos, you know, all over the, all over the globe, in that way, again, is a game changer. Like if he tried to do that even five, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it would be a monumental task. And in fact, I remember someone trying to do that from Manila, trying to get Filipino um, creators from the US and Canada to participate. And it was, it was hard. <laughs> it was really, I can't imagine the logistics of it. So I, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. I hope it's not too long winded. Wow, that's so like. Things have changed so much. I remember some of these changes, like not me personally working in writing or anything, but technologically when these things are happening. Um, we have a question from Jessie um, and she wants to know about your artistic process. She says, is it easy to break away from the stories and styles that influence you? Or do you kind of lean into your influences and kind of let notes of Garfield or Naruto uh, Naruto bubble up in your own work. I definitely think I consume so much media. So it's like a melting pot of what my influences are. Um, so I'm sure there are references in my work that I don't even realize because it's all subconscious at this point. Um, but yeah, just consume more art and then your art will involve and your stories will involve evolve and everything like that yeah i like to tell people that um a lot of people well a lot of younger artists kind of come up to me and ask me like how do you figure out your style and i always answer like your style is basically the culmination of all your references um your style can only get richer the more you consume so your style just comes naturally with what you enjoy so um, the most genuine, your most genuine art style is really diving into the stuff that you love and see where that takes you artistically. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm the sum of all the cartoons and comic books and TV and movie and books and people I've ever met in terms of influences. And I kind of, I have no problem wearing that on my sleeve. You know, I grew up reading, um, Archie comics and watching Bugs Bunny cartoons and they're always very referential to pop culture um, without, without being too, um, too dependent on, on those things. I mean, they continue to be funny without those references, if you know what I mean, and those influences. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, I have no problem with that. I think it's, it's sort of fun to, to show your influences or we could call them homages. I think that's really beautiful, like these ideas of inspiration and kind of connecting with those who went before us. Um, Luke has a question. Go ahead, Luke. 
Um, just quickly, one of the reasons that I was so, I'm so happy that we were able to do this is um, you guys are all really busy people and you've got a lot of different projects going on um, and you're working in kind of comics and graphic novels, but also, you know, the gaming industry and also sort of lots of different kinds of comics. Um, and I'm just wondering how difficult it is to sort of switch gears and work sort of in kind of different comic forms. And Joanna, if I could, I, I want to start with you. I mean, Joanna's at a really exciting time in her career, right? She's did a, a very long-standing um, uh, webtoon, and now she's working on her first graphic novel. I mean, is that a sort of difficult adjustment for you? Um, the reason why I stopped my web tune was because of burnout. So <laughs> um, I actually had to take, I think it was two years that I didn't draw. I just did not draw. And I, I just did other things to relieve myself from burnout. But then I came back to it because it's what I love. And um, even going between, because the books that I'm working on, they're both middle grade, but one is a younger middle grade technically, like so like eight-year-olds to 12-year-olds and then mine is like 12 and up and though my styles are essentially the same it still it still feels different to draw it because I have to draw like easier to read expressions for the other one for the younger one and stuff like that so it's just it is I, I do like separate it in terms of days. So if I'm working on one project, at least I focus on that one style that day and then the next day it's the other style. Uh, burnout is real. Um, <laughs> so much work to make comic books, right? Like I can't, um, sketching, uh, line work, coloring, finding the right font, the illustrating the lettering, like there's a shit ton of things that you're, you realize it's just never ending. Like you could keep refining this work. Um, I do like to jump around different art forms. Um, and, you know, not just, not just uh, like visual um, arts, but like recently I started getting into like screen printing. I guess that's visual <laughs> arts too, or also like, um, like metal work and it may seem like a disconnect, but ultimately what inspires me is a lot of the same uh, themes or subject matter. So it's still influencing uh, me as an artist, you know? So it's not deviating from my work. It's maybe it's deviating from my visual arts work, but it's not deviating from my work as a artist. Uh, I kind of feel the need to switch gears every now and then. Um, and not just within comics, but just do different things creatively uh, to try to avoid burnout. But of course, sometimes you just, you know, sometimes you hit a wall, there's nothing you can do. Um, but there's also times where, you know, you've got a deadline, so you have no choice, right? Burnout gets uh, put out by the, fo the, uh, the hose called deadlines. So, um, yeah, and I find that I, I find that you know juggling different projects and doing different things, whether it's in different genres or different medium, mediums that uh, that helps keep things fresh, if that makes sense, right? You keep you do other stuff, and um, you don't get too bored or too too sort of complacent with any. You don't get too comfortable. I think when you get too comfortable, you kind of lose your your drive a little bit. Right, so if you if you've got a mortgage, that's the best way to motivate you to keep working. I have two very expensive children, so that's the most the best motivation I can think of right now. Lindsay, please uh, uh, go ahead. Okay, so I have a question about how the potential for like maybe. Um, Asian superheroes um, to to break stereotypes, perhaps about Asianness, and let me explain because I remember when like Jeremy Lin, you know, sort of broke out as the basketball star in the NBA, and it was a big deal. You know, this uh, uh, you know a Chinese American basketball star. Um, but one thing he said in an interview is that he was tired about people asking him 
about his physical strength or lack of, you know, like they, he's like, I'm just so tired of like commentators showing me going up to, uh, you know, dunk or do a layup and I get hit by someone and they're like, yeah, he's pretty strong. He's pretty strong. He's like, of course I'm strong. I'm an NBA player, you know? So he was like sort of mentioning that there's this, you know, people don't even see it or understand it, but there's maybe like a deeply embedded idea that Asians are tall or they're not strong, you know? And so what is the potential then of like, say, you know, a hero uh, in, in, in one of your stories is sort of countering that kind of idea? You know, it's, it's tough because it's, it's, a, it's a real balancing act, if you will. On the one hand, you want to celebrate that you're Chinese or Filipino, and you want to you want to put it out there, right? Jeremy Lin, um, anybody in in sports, especially because it's such they're like such unicorns, right? If you'll pardon the expression, so you want to hold that up, and you want to go, oh look, there's the, there's actually you know two Filipinos or two and a half Filipinos in the NBA right now, which is a huge thing to me, uh, for example. But at the same time, you want to see them as NBA players, period. And it's the same with 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 our superheroes. Like you don't want stereotypes. Of, uh, of Asians as martial arts heroes, which drives me nuts, which is one of my problems with Shang-Chi, but that's a whole other panel there. Um, Marvel's first superhero lead has to be a martial artist guy. Like, I mean, come on, you know? Anyway, um, so it's like a really fine line. You have to straddle that fence that, uh, you know, that splits celebrating your differences, but at the same time, lets people know that you too can do X, Y, or Z. Uh, for me, because my comic is very magical, um, and it's, I, I get a lot of inspiration from, from like Lord of the Rings, so I'm used to very Western fantasy, um, so the way that I've changed it is just make that Filipino, <laughs> so all the spells are in Tagalog instead of Latin and stuff like that, and even like the magic circles are traditional patterns that you see in Filipino clothing and their tattoos. Um, so it's definitely, uh, the way that I go about it is to just, what am I so used to seeing in Western culture and just make it Filipino. <laughs> yeah, I, I try not to think about um, the characters of my work relative to, I guess, other characters in the media. Um, I try to just make the character as believable or genuine or like I even try to kind of avoid the whole superhero kind of trope or personality because um, I don't I don't like that whole focus on the individual uh, aspect of superheroes. Um, but I do think that, you know, it's just a question of, obviously there's, a, there, there's quality and quantity, but I also believe that the more there is, there are also gonna be just more quality characters that's gonna come about. And ultimately, like your stereotypical martial arts Asian guy is gonna be trumped by another type of um, character profile. That's just a uh, hundred times more interesting because eventually like we've, um, just gotten more creative, right? Um, so I think it's just a matter of time and quantity, to be honest. Um, and, you know, our job as artists is just to create the most, you know, genuine version of our art. And if, you know, if I can't do the best thing for the people, then ultimately someone will eventually, you know what I mean? I'm just doing the best that I could do. Um, I kind of want have this question about like um, thinking about yourself as you know Filipino or Filipino Canadian and how and belonging to this community and it's something that we talked about kind of a lot in the last panel but like how does that influence how you see yourself in in like working in this genre or or the create the the creative process like um, the characters and and stories that you create. 
Sorry, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, just repeat that. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Like just how how your identity um as or belonging to this community of Filipino Canadians. Like how does that how does that affect how you see yourself within like as writing in the genre or how it affects your process, the stories that you create, um, how you how you depict things, even like you were talking about um, putting putting in like the baskets or using the the magic circles, like the patterns that you put them in. So kind of like seeing yourself as part of uh, a community of a culture, but also like a community of specifically Filipino Canadian, you know, uh, graphic novelists, comic book artists, that kind of thing. Well, for me, it's, I guess maybe it's a bit of an ego thing, but I'm constantly putting myself in my work, whether it's intentional or subconscious, you know? Um, and if it's not me, it's an aunt or an uncle, my sister, my cousins, unintentionally or not, um, because it's who, who I am. Um, and because they're Filipino like me, then that kind of comes out. And um, the hope is that it doesn't come out forced, that it comes out natural, that the character feels like that's who they are, not like, oh, look, it's a Filipino comic book, <laughs> you know, which is also a good thing, of course, because uh, <clears throat> we need more of that out there. And again, it's that fine line I was talking about startling, you know, the fence between, you know, waving your flag and being humble and just doing your thing, right? Uh, so I think if you come from that kind of uh, space or position of kind of authenticity and just be yourself, it'll come out. And it sounds like that everybody here, you know, that's what we basically strive to do. And because we are Filipino and we are proud of who we are, where we come from and everything that comes with it, it'll just come out naturally and look really, you know, cool, like a magic circle based on a, a tribal tattoo. Like that's, that sounds fantastic to me. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that. And it's not like she forced it. She's like, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, no one has a wand. They're all carrying wooden spoons because it's Filipino thing. No, it's just the thing that works, right? Yeah, yeah. I, like my work is like so Filipino, right? Because I try to, like, I don't even think about it. It's just, I'm immersed in a lot of Filipino things, right? Like I do consume <clears throat> Filipino music. I try to watch the Filipino news. Um, um, so I try to just stay up to date with art and stuff. So, and just the volunteer work as well. So. Um, this is not something I'm active, like I'm not thinking in my head, oh, I want to make a Filipino comic. It's just, it just so happens that my work is going to be Filipino because um, this is my genuine self, right? For me, it's, this is how I'm exploring my identity. Uh, I just grew up in predominantly white neighborhood, predominantly white schools. Um, and because of how my parents raised me, not necessarily learning Tagalog and everything like that. And so all of it is just exploring what I don't know and trying to showcase it more for that other kid that was like me that doesn't know anything about the Philippines and the culture. Yeah, I really feel like, I feel that. I, growing <laughs> up in Winnipeg and like predominantly white neighborhood, going to school with like, Bunch of white kids, yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of growing up in Canada, uh, on the kind of on the flip side, how do you feel about like your Canadian identity and how like not that it's different or separate from the Filipino side of things, but um, how do you feel like the Canadian side of things influences what you do? Does is it different? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think so. Um, anytime I visit the Philippines or, you know, talk to my cousins, you can see how different we are because of where we grew up. Um, and even just talking to my American friends and, again, on a very practical level, how lucky we are as Canadians to have stuff like universal health care, for example. Um, I have American friends who are literally one catastrophic medical incident away from bankruptcy like seriously that's how bad it is in the U.S. or how bad it can be if you don't have insurance and you're like a freelancer but we 
as Canadians don't have to worry about that so much, you know, and, and, and just this week, for example, uh, the checks from the uh, PLR came out, the public lending right came out and my American friends were like, what the hell is that? What do you mean the library pays you money for your books? So again, you know, props to Canada Arts Council and so on. <clears throat> so that, plus the fact that we grew up around, you know, um, predominantly white people and, and not only that, but like a, a, a diversity of cultures. I mean, at least for me growing up in Montreal, like, I mean, I had friends from all over the place and every single one of them were just as proud about where they came from as we were, right? And people shared all that kind of stuff. So I think that's what makes Canada Canada, right? Because my cousins in the US are pretty assimilated to like what it is to be American. It's kind of weird to me. Um, like if you say Philippine, I mean, maybe not these days, but you know, maybe a few years back, a decade or so back, if you said I'm Filipino Canadian and they would say I'm American, that's just it. There's no Filipino American, there's no hyphen, there's no. It's just a very, you know what I mean? Like it's a very different sort of vibe and uh, way of expressing yourself. Um, and so because of that, I'm proud to have this sort of dual identity, if you will. Um, and actually it's almost triple because I grew up in Montreal and there was this difference between the French and the English and the East and the West thing. Um, so I'm very proud of that, which I think uh, made me what I am today. So yeah, I mean, to answer your question, <clears throat> you know, you can be both and you can be proud of both. And, um, you know, it's like a marriage, like a happy marriage. Uh, I yeah, I wanted to, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, okay. just to piggyback on what Jay Torres was saying, because he is, um, he grew up in Montreal, like I'm in Montreal, right? And um, like I try to say that I'm Filipino Montrealer because um, I feel like our experience as French Canadians, like we have different accessibilities compared to other Canadians, right? Um, just, just in terms of language, for example, like our upbringing was at least slightly different from other Canadians because of the French language. Like I had to grow up as a French to English translator for my parents. Um, growing up with uh, just, different ethnic minorities because, you know, um, different uh, people immigrate to Quebec as well. So I, like I want to extend it to, or be more specific in that, like more than just Filipino Canadian, there's like Filipinos of specific provinces. Um, they have their own kind of experience identity and they're probably gonna share stories totally differently um, from one region to the other. I don't think it's any different than like my parents being proud of being from Pampanga, right? And speaking the, their dialect as well as, as, sorry, as, well as Tagalog. Um, and we have friends who are Ilocano and, you know, they speak their dialects and Mindan from Mindanao. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's the same thing with us. Although we don't have a dialect, it's kind of forced on us, <laughs> the French and all that. But yeah, so I think it's the same thing, right? Uh, for me, it's it's something that I never really thought about until now, that I'm like seeing that I'm Canadian. And it, it's, I guess it's, I know that I'm very fortunate in my opportunities and the fact that I can work on comics is a very, like, I'm very lucky to be able to do that. It's not for the faint of heart, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know if I could do it in the States because of the whole health thing and just the like i started comics officially right when covid hit because i had the time to and because serb was a thing and like our canadian government happened to be nicer than the fact that americans only got 1200 for all of that um we got two grand every month <laughs> um so it, it is very like I'm, I'm very fortunate and i i recognize that So we're coming close to time. Are there any final questions? No? Maybe if we need silence for long enough. Um, okay, so. Since uh, we're at the end here, I'd like to 
thank our panelists for being so great and coming out here and giving us such incredibly like thoughtful, thought provoking answers and and just it's so incredible to hear about your experiences within the industry and personally. Um, we also have the giveaway. So yay, um, to thank the attendees for coming and participating and hearing all of the stuff, the great things that we have to say. And we have two winners and they are Stella Sai and Timothy Penner. So if you can get in contact or if, yeah, in the chat, send your email addresses to um, one of the organizers and, and yeah, they'll get in touch with you and, and organize uh, sending you out some of these incredible uh, comics that we've been hearing about. Um, let's finish off, Luke. Well, uh, first, um, thank you to to uh, all three of you, and Sabrina, thank you very much for for moderating. That was really um, um, that was really great. Um, I just want to say uh, how grateful I am to everybody to everybody for making time and you know spending even more time on Zoom uh, than you already have um, uh, to be here. Um, one of the comments that that really stuck with me from the first panel is that you know sort of as soon as we we, we sort of point to a category like uh, Filipino Canadian comics, um, all of a sudden that category is seems very insufficient and almost confining because people are doing all kinds of things. People have all kinds of different um, uh, there are all kinds of different versions of uh, being Filipino, being being Canadian, and um, this is, I'm really glad that we started having this conversation and I hope it uh, continues. Um, let me just say again, um, for anybody who's interested in um, kind of talking about some of these issues in a, in a kind of more academic context, um, please get in touch with me. Um, I, I'm, I'd like to put together uh, something about um, Filipino kind of diaspora comics. And um, I, I put the, the call for proposals again um, in the chat. Um, it's been kind of a long afternoon and I don't wanna keep anybody any longer, but I do wanna say um, thank you very much for the University of Manitoba Institute for the Humanities um, for all of their support. Um, I want to uh, give a big thanks to uh, Eleanor T for her wonderful uh, keynote. Um, thank you very much to all of the panelists um, uh, for making time and just, I just loved, you know, loved hearing from the creators of comics that I really, really like and have already spent a lot of time with. I mean, that was really, really fun. Um, and I also want to thank uh, a big thank you to Akene, uh, Gina, and Jesse for um, keeping everything uh, uh, on track uh, this afternoon. So thank you much, very much, everybody. Um, have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, and I hope we can keep talking. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>